moving on into chimneys and we're going to stop uh half an hour for lunch at one o'clock yeah. okay here's chimneys chimneys mm -hmm. and how do they not leak slate roofs chimneys stuck in valleys well it's not like it doesn't rain that's ireland but somehow they got it somehow that's working but it, they don't deal with snow they're not they don't have four feet of snow sitting in those houses materials they can be stone brick concrete block manufactured masonry newer replacement uh cast refractory linings manufactured metal can be newer replacement here, a gorgeous stone chimney. This is my house. This is my house, ooh, 14 years ago. Um, we took the tops down, put new brick back up because the brick was just done. So the brick is no longer blue. Got rid of the vines. They've come back and got rid of them again and put linings in. Um, two fireplaces theoretically work. We only use one linings. One they couldn't get refractory. They custom stainless metal. How many flues? One, two, three, four, five flues. We actually discovered a fireplace in the kitchen when we took the plaster off. Um, thirty five thousand dollars. And that didn't deal with any of the repointing of the stone or anything. So it can be done, but you know, there's there's cost to it. But um, dampers on top also. The dampers on top. I forgot shared linings. I'll show you. I've got an inside photo. <laughs> I know I got it. Yeah, I got a, a photo down my chimney before the before picture. This is an attempt to uh, repoint with soft mortar. Right idea, miserable implementation. A chimney that was probably actually extended up a little bit. A beautiful concrete crown. Again, Winchester needs a little pointing, but but very nice. Whole bunch of chimneys in that house. Now you want to just check these chimneys carefully. You see that chimney? That's the attic. What do you not see there? See that chimney? That's the attic. On that board, boards. You, yeah. How, why? It's Can't fake, answer that. It's a fake chimney. Fake chimney. It's a fake chimney. Oh my goodness. That's the bottom of the chimney. Listing I would say so. <laughs> I would say so. Didn't come down in the earthquake. That's amazing. <laughs> Look at this stuff carefully. Oh, you know. And well, I found this in the attic, and then I, you know, when I'd done, you know, been outside and hey, that chimney, and that's not, oh, you get in these little sheds in the backyard and stuff, that's all the time. I didn't say it was stable. It's it's sitting on some wood tied to the rafters, maybe a couple studs under it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you look carefully at this stuff. I'm like, whoa, baby. And a hundred and odd years old. This, <laughs> all the mason brick leaks, they've got this copper flashing like quarter inch copper drain tubes so when when the water drained out they collected it in a little internal copper gutter little bitty drains drains are underside i mean good but might need that oh yeah it's a, yeah i'm in an attic i'm in an attic this is not really old last time i was that i'd seen that sitting like that for 15 years i think I, I haven't been past it in years but yeah wood stove single wall clearance to combustibles you just terracotta flue liners yeah and 
still at least I got it up above the roof, which is probably next to the chimney. And I, I mean, I've, I'd seen that there like that for 15 years. Pro presumably some fools using that. Um, linings, none. Less than eight inches of masonry separation between the uh, different flues. Eight inches or greater is ideal. Terracotta flue tiles came in about plus or minus 1920. Homes generally before 1920. Uh, did not have linings. Why did they start lining these chimneys? They discovered carbon monoxide. Prior to that, Uncle Frank died in his sleep. Wasn't it peaceful? No, it wasn't. It was carbon monoxide. So that's, you know, somewhere around 1920, you start seeing the terracotta flu linings. And there's metal and, and masonry retrofit linings. Nice looking brick chimney, looks a tad thin, terracotta out the top, but that's kind of why I like to look down them or up them if you can. Two pieces of terracotta on the top and one's running the furnace and the other is a fireplace. And you can see there probably used to be mortar between all those bricks. Um, so flue lining, you know, Immediate. Ah, uh, we've never had any problems yet. I'm pretty sure that's that chimney, but I do. Oh, I, I pull those covers off. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Particularly an old house. I pull those covers off and put them back. Somebody got them on. Sometimes you kind of wish you didn't. <laughs> but that's, you know, whenever you're trying to do the best job you can, there's something that, man, I wish I hadn't done that. I just inaccessible or you can't get to them. You know, for some reason I could get to that and let's, well, you know, hold your camera up and just take half a dozen photos and one of them is going to show you stuff like that. Yep. Oh yeah, yeah. However, however you can do it. Uh, fire it on a pole down that. Sure, absolutely. Um, again, you know, no lining. If that's used as a fireplace, how can you possibly clean that? Clearance to combustibles very common. Structural support of wood framing. We saw that. No lining. Internal deterioration. Relining, which can fail external deterioration, seismic and wind loading. That's engineer if, if you live in an area where that becomes uh, an issue. How much is too much? This is all seat of the pants stuff for you guys, uh, men and women, you people. Um, you don't wanna be every little cracks, just a disaster, but it's, and, and only experience just gives you a, a feel for it. It's look inside if you can. I mean, I climb the roofs. I try to see down inside the, the old houses, the new houses. You know, you're, you're not as worried, but the old houses, if you can, you want to see down in that chimney, if possible, top or bottom or whatever. Here, this is an oil. Blue double wall there, single wall here, hacked through a log, and this was, oh yeah, you know, a couple nails. Um, you can just see stuff pouring out of the chimney and wood against it, double wall, yeah, but double wall needs clearances, not like wood against it. Um, as you heat wood over time, its temperature of ignition drops, it pyrolyzes. So over time, as it's been, been that way for 40 years, it's fine. No, it's much worse than it was 40 years ago because at some point, if the temperature that the wood is heated to and the temperature that the wood burns, which is dropping over time, cross, then the wood starts to smolder. So it's, it's been that way for a long time, it's okay. No, it's worse. And this is a potential, you know, please burn the house down. I was, I was in a basement, yeah. yeah. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah. Put a post on one side anyhow. Oh, yeah. I mean, just mess and from a number of points of view. Here, um, again, structure just sitting on it. That was not a fireplace. That was a pot belly coal stove in that chimney. Uh, you know, what's going on there? You have no idea because it's all foam. This was my chimney before the application of thousands of dollars. Um, yes. Damn. Yes. Yes. That sky. That sky. They had separation between the flues. That's the inside of that chimney. You know, that's the inside of that chimney. Um, so this was all, it was taken down to the stone. And for some reason, out Shenandoah Valley, I don't see it many, I don't know historically where it is or why, but stone to the second floor ceiling and then brick on top. Um, so once you get down to the second floor ceiling, it, it went to stone. So all this brick came down to the second floor ceiling, to the stone, new brick that looks like old brick. I would have loved to have used that, but it just, it just crumbled. Uh, went back up, out the roof, metal or uh, masonry flue linings. One, he couldn't get the masonry in, so did a stainless steel metal. So. Um, piles of money. If these are being used, that's like must do stuff. Must do stuff. Why the house didn't burn? Just luck. Oh, we had a wood, you know, fireplace inefficient. They had a wood stove in the first floor, <coughs> probably single wall metal going right up through the second floor into the chimney in the second floor through a bedroom. You know, you burn a living, you touch that. Yeah. Um, just luck, grace of God, karma, whatever your personal belief system is, keeps these houses going. But if your client buys it, they need to know uh, these issues. Again, this is another chimney. They were supporting the terracotta with a couple pieces of rebar. Oh yeah, that's just you know, that's the top. So you terracotta coming out. We're happy. Maybe not so much. Maybe not so much. That's, you know, and again, that's, you know, just a telephoto picture down in there, but the brick doesn't look real happy inside that. And that's a primary heating chimney. That's not a fireplace. There's no creosote or anything in that, which is worse, but this is, this is primary heating. Usually they're oil too. Advantage of oil heat is if you have a leak, it stinks. Gas, not so, no odor. Um, I think this was in the fireplace looking up. Uh, again, if somebody really wants to use this, we've got a house with fireplaces. We can have fires now. Yes, you can. It may be the entire house. You know, and that's, you know, it may be. And uh, you're reading the newspaper, house burns down. First thing I look, did I inspect that house? No. Oh. Nope. Nope. Oh, and I, I will get the, we'll, we'll get the, yeah, no damper. Um, the damper's on top, great. Other than you've got this long, tall column of heated air trying to get out. Um, we have dampers on top. Now I'm about ready to the fireplace. We don't use just stuff fiberglass in the bottom because I figured out we're filling that long, tall exterior masonry column with warm air, potentially why it costs part of the $1,500 a month in wintertime for propane. Um, here, metal roof, nice stone chimney. There was a fireplace on that, but obviously not used. And and the oil, the oil furnace. And this, I think, yeah, this is that stone house. I got a lot of pictures out of that. But how are you going to clean it? How are you going to get a liner down it? It wasn't used. It wasn't used. Just simply wasn't used. Um, great candidate for an electric heat pump 
or you know plan b on that because you can't get a liner down it you you know it's and that's that's how it was built obviously a stonemason the inside of probably that same house where the oil furnace was venting you know that's your fireplace pretty clean down in there that's probably the oil furnace maybe i don't know but there's evidence of use and you know fire safety you're probably okay but the integrity of the you know the exhaust gases 100% of the exhaust gases getting out through that chimney you know there's no guarantee of that might be but might and you know, this is life and death stuff sometimes um these little pie plates on the chimneys well that's where the potbelly stove was so they are your friend because you can pull that off you might put a drop cloth down first when the stuff comes out but you can show your clients there is no lining in here and this is connected to your oil or gas boiler generally furnace whatever in the cellar and it's venting through this so if for some reason like the squirrel builds a nest or for some reason the chimney doesn't want to draft that's your second easiest spot for the exhaust from the primary heating system in that house to come out into the second floor at the bedrooms bad stuff people die from this amazingly well these days you hear about everything so amazingly infrequently but but it lets you pull that open so you can take a couple pictures up and down and show your clients like day one stuff unless they're buying the house in june then they have like three or four months no uh, we have never had any problems with it yet because that's what the inside can look like. All the stuff falling down. The oil is just, you know, acidic exhaust, water. You're making uh, sulfuric acid, I believe. Yeah, sulfur from burning oil. Mix it with water, you've made sulfuric acid, which the inside of the chimney has been subjected to for generations. Um, you know, day one stuff external deterioration there is a lining in there that's that's a big plus is there a lining in there hard to say spent a ton of money on the roof and the copper flashing didn't do squat on the chimney itself and if you can if you can get to the top of that safely and yank one of those take your camera snappy snappy they're the ones uh that may or may not that terracotta, you might be looking at the only two pieces of terracotta in that chimney. Odds are decent on that. This was a pretty old house. And, you know, they extended it up. So how far down does the terracotta go? My guess is there. Um, chimney didn't move. Chimney was built like that. Came up through the house one spot. The mason wanted it like an inch over. So pouring out of the chimney. So there is physical evidence of if you got creosote leaking out of the chimney, you have exhaust gases leaking out of the chimney where it can be seen in the attic and the chimney runs through the starts at the first floor, runs through the second floor with the bedrooms through the attic and out. No, sir. No, my house didn't look anywhere near that good. That was all it was all that funky brick. We, you were looking down the inside of it. So the outside in the attic kind of looked, oh yeah, daylight in the attic too. And they were running wood stoves and fire, you know. Chimney got worse over time. But yeah, this is creosote on the outside of the chimney. That, you know, this is day one stuff. Here, you just you wonder. I mean, maybe they had both a combustion air and the exhaust in that masonry chimney maybe because they stuffed that hole with fiberglass so somebody made the hole um the exhaust is highly acidic from this stuff going to rot the living daylights out of it so totally wrong Nic nickel dime fixes 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. High efficiency gas furnace. Gas or propane. Yeah. In intake and intake and exhaust. And they one one pipe sticking out, you're gonna be really upset by two plastic pipes sticking out the side of your house. Or put the torpedo double fitting on them. You know, relative nickel dime fix, but and you know that that pretty sure the manufacturer doesn't in their instructions say jam this plastic exhaust pipe into your masonry chimney and leave it go pretty sure you're not going to find that in the instructions here you can see the chimneys walked away now really old house really tall chimney grand scheme of things if you've got a half inch crack there the movement at the base of that chimney is microscopic is thousands of an inch and fixing is an issue but a lot of these actually they went right past the side wall of the house so there's no flashing between the roof and the chimney because the chimney doesn't impinge upon the roof doesn't go through the roof but movement so an engineer not just fill the joint with caulk or whatever engineer but if that's all it moved, at least stop the water running down in there because then it's into the wall and doing bad stuff. Um, take it down, put it back up again. You know, it's showing signs of basically failure. You'll see a lot of them. And that wasn't, that wasn't the worst. I mean, I've seen them about 45 degrees. Um, Okay, you can can you can corbel brick. You can you can cantilever brick. If you've got an eight inch brick, you can cantilever it two inches for a number of rows. But the center of gravity, and actually, in, in this chimney is is about there, and it's going straight down. So the center of gravity of this chimney, the top of this chimney is not being supported by the bottom. So the chimney wants to come down couple of boards there nailed to a uh, cleat across a couple rafters probably not really going to hold that probably not and it's been there for 100 years yeah but you're buying the house there's your duct work with it. hey yeah um engineer if it's not being used it could be taken down and then your high efficiency, the high efficiency where you abandon the use of the chimneys. Great, 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 great. A lot of these chimneys, so much money to fix them and use them. You go to high efficiency equipment, you don't, you abandon the use of the chimney. You're saving 10 to 25% of your heating costs by doing so. And so spending money to fix the chimney is throwing it away. And we've also seen that you can just like take the chimney down and put a couple boards under it and hold the top sticking out the roof. We've already seen that. Obviously, that can be done. Um, questions at this point? We're not at one o'clock. I'll just move into, into part two. There's uh, one question online that has to do with uh, noting the lack of spark arresters or rain tanks. We don't live in California. It rains here relatively frequently, so um, I don't I don't really recommend them. Chimneys are basically holes aimed at the sky. That are, should the rain should be able to go down and not bother anything. Not bad, but if you're using it for wood heat, you're now trapping creosote, which. And the chimneys are, old chimneys are intended to be just aimed at the sky without a cover on them. I mean, you think about it, what's a chimney do? Get the exhaust product up and out through the house, aimed at the sky. It's a hole aimed at the sky. So rain going, rain doesn't bother masonry typically, unless you mix it with sulfur. Do, do, do you remember? I know I have what. Close your damper and they're, they'll get gassed. 
if you're using it for heat. I, you know, I don't think squirrels have any incentive. There's no nothing for a squirrel down the chimney. Cool beans. All righty. Now we're going to move on to interiors. Super, 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 super. Egress. Window size and operation below grade habitable rooms. I could put dozens more photos of this. Doors and, and stairways, egress doors, egress stairways. Um, egress came into the building codes, for, egress from bedrooms, and bedrooms are your primary concern, I think the 60s. So it's been in the code for a long while, been ignored. Below grade basements, I really, I was thinking, man, I, I know I have dozens and dozens of photos of those somewhere. Uh, but once, if a basement's only used for storage and mechanical equipment, doesn't need egress. But if you're using it for anything else, it needs egress, two means of egress. And that came into the code after there was a fire in a townhouse in Maryland where an entire family of five died. The code changed a few years after that, requiring two means of egress out of a finished basement. Um, not a bedroom now, but if you've got a finished basement, you need two ways out. Bedrooms need immediate egress, meaning a bedroom has to have a way from the bedroom outside a finished basement. You can go from, from one room to another room to get to the egress, but the stairs up, into the house is one means of egress. Finished basement needs two means of egress. And these old houses in the 60s, they had the little basement windows and finished rec rooms and stuff. That's what you used to do. And so the that is an important part of your inspection. That's life safety. That's somebody not being able to get out of a house. And so it's in your report and people will cry and the realtors will cry. You're, you know, it's an old house, it's grandfathered. You tell that to the you know family of five that got cooked because they couldn't get you know they had three families stuffed in a townhouse in in Maryland the family in the basement when the house caught on fire all got cooked in in the basement um, and every now and then you just you follow the news the paper whatever your your method of information gathering it happens on a somewhat regular basis where people are just stuck it's it's life safety stuff. Any one of those egress departments? No. No. Um, fire sprinkler systems are wonderful. They limit property loss and they cut deaths to almost zero, but they don't change egress requirements at all because people can be overcome by smoke. Little teeny fire. Oh. House in Annapolis, big house. Grandparents and one or two kids died when the Christmas tree went up. Mm. That was before Maryland required fire sprinkler systems in the house. You know, instantly, you basically have a giant combustible thing in the house, two story balcony, bedrooms, and these new houses, man, when they, catch fire, they just go and they collapse immediately. The structural real framing, you can burn a two by 10 for quite a while before it fails. Manufactured framing, the houses explode in fl flames, they collapse almost immediately. That's why the firefighters will not go into a house unless there's a person inside. And that's why the firefighters die. 
Um, but egress sprinkler systems do not negate egress requirements, but they're, they are great. Um, this house had no egress windows, 5.7 square feet fully operable. These are double hung windows. They don't tilt in. Replacing one of the windows with a vinyl double hung where both sash tilt. If both sash move and both sash tilt, you can count both sash for your 5.7 square feet. So just replacing one window, you can do one window and it becomes egress. And here I think, no, that was actually neither of these windows tilted. That was just the back of the house. They didn't spend money on the, you know, the six over sixes, but just replacing one of those windows with a vinyl double hung window, just that makes it, you know, you only need one window in a bedroom as, as an egress window. But a lot of these older houses, no, no egress windows. This is my house, old, older photo, but kind of same thing, but um, they're not egress. They're not 20 inches wide. They're like 16, eight, 18 inches wide, not 5.7 square feet. It's a historic house. Would I replace those? No, we spent thousands of dollars on exterior screens, interior storm windows. Our curtains would blow in, in the wind. I mean, literally you watch the curtains. So, uh, but here, this is our bedroom. We have a walk-in closet, no door with a larger window out onto a porch roof. So, uh, and just hoping the house doesn't burn, but finally put smoke detectors in. Finally put smoke detectors in 10 year interconnected battery backup, man. They're great. Took me 20 years, but then 23 years got smoke detectors up to code. Well, I started doing it in my rental houses because I knew I was going to get just nailed and lose everything if a rental house caught fire without smoke detectors. So I bought a bunch of them online, 30 bucks a pop. Every house should have smoke detectors. Even mine does now. Pardon? Yeah, but they're not the 10-year batteries. They're the $4 ones. They're not the interconnected wirelessly, though. But do they interconnect? Okay. Um, 30 bucks a pop, interconnect, 10 year battery. And oh, they're just great. They're absolutely good. So there is absolutely no reason that every house should not have smoke detectors up to current standards. Um, yeah, no reason at all. Stairs, headroom, riser and tread dimensions. Straighten the floor in this one. So you come down, you build up your rhythm. The bottom again, once somebody's fallen and broken an ankle a couple, three, four times, they'll figure it out. But guests and visitors just, just don't. You can't do anything about it, but note it in your report. It's a safety concern. It's a trip hazard. Would I tear those stairs, recommend tearing those stairs out to fix that? Absolutely not but get under it and see what they did and why is that there wasn't built that way, was not built that way. These carpenters, I mean, particularly a nice house like this. I mean, they knew that this has been common sense carpentry for hundreds, thousands of years. You probably go through Rome and the temples and stuff. And I bet all their damn risers and treads are within three eighths of an inch. Because they knew you're going down 50 stone steps and you trip and fall, man. You got a bad day. Nice with the risers and treads, about six foot headroom. Which, if you're 5'10 and you're standing on your toes, you're any taller, whack. Not a lot you can do about it. Note it. You wouldn't do it that way today. Here, somebody had an issue, and this slide is probably 20 years old. Like, well, you're not going to hit your head on one side. It finally occurred to me why someone would do that. Box springs. Oh, yeah. They had to get the box springs upstairs, and they just didn't fit. Oh, they notch all kinds of structure. Oh, yeah. Ha. And if you lean to the one side, you're not whacking your head. I was like, why would they do that on one side? And it finally occurred to me just this last week. 
furniture, box springs, box springs, get it up the stairs. Um, here, somebody built a cabinet entertainment center. So you can see like a four and a half foot tall door. This was a, a slab porch or something enclosed, really nice room. That's about 18 inches, funky handrail. This was down, this is a photo way, way, way early in the presentation, but my client was going down the cellar with me, nailed his head on that. Didn't expect this, was going through looking at his head, went way down, nailed his head on that. He was bald, he had a you know, pretty good gash on his head. But this was the way to get into the cellar of that house to get to stuff you had to get to, mechanical systems. Nasty, nasty and lousy handrail. Um, what the heck you gonna do? Hard to say, but that's not your problem. Your problem is, well, it's only a set of cellar steps. We're gonna get to all these kind of steps now. Little four foot door. Went between, you know, obviously the main original house in addition to the back floor level change. There was a much, you know, larger entrance with nice sets of steps. But oddly enough, in the inspection, for whatever reason, I went through that door about 10 times, 12 times. It just it was really convenient to go where I was going. Uh, but yeah, door height. Well, that one's kind of obvious. Unless you're like less than four feet, you're not going to be ducking. Winders. They're all over. Um, well, let's take them out and put in code steps. Okay, which room, which two rooms on the first and second floor do you want to lose to put a set of code compliant steps in that house? That's what it's going to take. You just physically no space to do that. How you got to put a handrail in? My thought is a piece of closet rod vertical held off that somebody coming down those steps can at least hang on with one hand. If you step off coming down with the left foot, you can be down three steps. So if they've got something to hang on to, you can make it better, but in, you know, it's historic fabric, historic context, and to actually redo it physically takes so much more space than is actually there. It's not, take it out and put code steps in. Which two rooms do you want to lose to do that? Now, here was the same situation, all concrete down into a basement. This was in an addition. There was um, lots of stuff down there. The laundry was down there. It, again, just handrails, impossible to fix. And, you know, poured concrete, you know, again, somebody somewhere down in Shenandoah County. Shenandoah County is almost as bad as West Virginia. I mean, I, you see hairball, st screwball stuff all over the place, but Shenandoah County, oh, the inspections there were just, no one cared. Um, like it or don't, you know, fix is lots of money and you're losing, you know, you got to get the space to do a legitimate set of steps from somewhere. But the handrail, you know, must do stuff. You know, one by tens. Cut out. The furnace was down there. The termite guy was a big guy coming down the steps like a week after me. They broke under him. They just collapsed. Um, you know, miserable. You, you rise and run. You're going to be hard pressed. Uh, well, going up is better than going down. Uh, but, I, you know, but they literally collapsed under somebody. Again, like every issue that you can possibly have with stairs, handrails, guardrails is in there. Width. Now, the width was put in the building code by the furniture industry. So if I see a set of steps that's a few inches narrow, I'm really, it's a, okay, it doesn't meet code, but unless you're like four feet wide, you're going to get down the steps. So the width of stairs are 30 versus 36 inches or, or 28 versus 30. Um, I don't make, a, it's not a big deal, impossible to fix. 
But here you can see, you know, washer and dryer, somebody's using those set of steps. Oh, that's the house that had the, was stone, brick, and addition. So you had two outside doors that you could actually get to that. So if you don't mind walking around the entire house with your laundry, you don't have to use those steps. Run a sewer line through it just for good measure. Mm -hmm. um, how do you fix it? Well, you can certainly do things to make those steps better, and they're one buys. What's that? Well, I, yeah, a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff on that. And if the little kids get in there, they go climbing through here, nasty. And they kept it from sliding on the concrete by nailing a cleat in front. So you come down there and, and that, I don't know, the realtor came down the steps, fell. You know, so you're in these, doing these inspections, calling the, oh, did a lousy, uh, tall first riser, front porch steps. Showed my client, showed the realtor. They went inside, they came back out 15 minutes later, fell on the steps that I'd showed them 15 minutes before. Cause I mean, they're looking at all kinds of things. So, you know, I, I don't know how many times I've pointed these things out and during the inspection, someone fell on the steps. So if that's like in a finite couple hours that you're there, how many times have other people fallen down the stairs and nobody's fixed them here attack, you know, put the cleat behind, secure it. I mean, and these stairs, obviously, you know, they need lots of stuff. Um, yeek. Um, but, you know, boiler and water heater down there. And if the service, if they collapse under the service person, you know, they're going to sue. You know, yeah, the service person going down there, I mean, if you injure yourself, your uh, health insurance company will sue your homeowner's insurance company to get, everybody wants to get their money back. But if a service person that has to go down those to get to whatever is down there falls and, you know, is injured, you know, it's, so this stuff, it certainly can be made much better. It's all one buys. One buys, little teeny cleats, little nails against a damp wall, nails rust. You see how many of these just absolutely miserable basement and, and cellar steps and they're masonry. They're just nasty, random risers, random treads, um, just nasty. At a minimum, put a handrail. At a minimum, that's an, you know, that's like the bare minimum. The fixes, jackhammer them out and pour a set of steps. Piles of money, but at a minimum, a handrail. And these, a lot of times, these are, you know, stairs that are being used on a very frequent basis. Um, brick house was an outside porch with an outside set of steps. They put in, you know, walls, windows, concrete slab, nice tile. First step was 12 inches. Down a set of concrete steps into the basement. And what the heck are you going to do about that? And it got a handrail, nice handrail, but somebody's hanging on with one arm doing a header down a set of concrete steps. Eesh. In your report, leave somebody else figure out what the people bought it. Not a problem. We'll get used to it. Okay. Guy service in your furnace might not, that first step's a doozy. Um, oh, yeah. Jackhammer it out put a, a landing in there or something like that. Oh, absolutely. But not, you know, nothing simple or, or easy, but I just an absolute nasty, nasty hazard. Um, guardrails and handrails, stability, the 50 pounds of linear foot and 200 pounds horizontally, no, no rail. Almost no rail was ever built that would meet those those standards. Um, yeah, I mean, almost no nothing will will meet those standards. Um, your spacing and you know these other 
other steps. I mean, they've got like every, every issue. Handrail is an absolute minimum. Um, porch overlooking, nice field. There's a creek somewhere out there. That was about two feet high, 15 feet down on the rocks. Built into the into the a mountain going down to the floodplain there. Oh, a handrail should is designed should be designed to hold fifty pounds per linear foot. So if you have an eight foot railing, it should be able to hold four hundred pounds evenly distributed. So that's on your deck where everybody runs out and looks at the deer in your backyard. 50 pounds a linear foot and 200 pounds horizontally at any point. They finally changed, it used to be both directions. It used to be 200 pounds from outside. So if someone was standing outside your deck, floating in air, they finally changed the code to, if you can't stand out there, you don't need to resist the forces. So all these new fasteners are designed to resist you know, the forces from someone on the deck leaning out on the rail, but the rail no longer has to resist somebody outside standing in air, Superman trying to push the deck rail over. Or yeah, anybody who can like levitate. If they can levitate, they can just kind of like go right over the rail and onto the deck anyhow. But 200 pound point load, 200 pound point load. No, you know, 200 pounds, that guy might do it. Yeah, I mean, some of them might, but yeah, that one, you know, would help you over if you backed up against it. Overhead first, 15 feet down on the rocks. And I'm, I'm like, I have this, I'm like, man, I wish I had, you know, a photo at that point of the front of the house with, you know, just showing. Um, this is that screwball edition out there, but again, leaning on these things um when they re you see new wood flooring in there just get in there and start looking at the edges of that flooring it's all if it's more than a couple years old it's rotting and is that going to hold 200 pounds at any point and you know 10 12 feet long times 50 pounds a foot and people are coming out on there using it Sliding glass doors, they all open. They all open. Screens. This was a not, not an Airbnb, but a, a bed and breakfast. That was an attorney owned that and rented the house to just like random people. You know, just random people rent the house on the river. Gorgeous, gorgeous. We'll see this as almost the last slide in the presentation, but open the sliding doors pull back the screen, all of which were functioning perfectly and step out into space, you might, you know, you'd hit that roof and then I'd flip your head first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Stairs to an apartment. Stairs to an apartment. A rental. Can't make this stuff up. Can't make this stuff up. Just ah. Is that the only egress? Uh, I think you know the bedrooms might have had egress windows, and and well, doesn't I, make any. I've got access to that roughly. Is that the only? Yes, answer? yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. There was oh yeah no they didn't want the apartment tenants coming down into the first floor. No, that was the sole walking way in and out of the house. Oh, thank you. Walk out the door, step down, walk across the roof. If you're lucky and sober, you wind up on the stairs. Either in or out. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't make it up. Just because it's in an attic doesn't mean you can't have the same problems. You know, it's made of like two by twos and openings and put the door so the little kid doesn't fall through or whatever. This stuff needs to be in your report. It's a little less of a concern, but everybody's loading their stuff in and out and little kids are in there climbing around and all kinds of stuff. 
bathroom door, powder room door, out or out it over a porch. You'd probably make enough noise that the person in the powder room would figure out what's what's going on before I I exit. That was West Virginia. And you can see it was like a bill code door. They built over it. That was your crawl space entrance. Um, you know, old houses, this is this is really, really common. The second set, you've got a main nice front stairs. This is your back stair down into the kitchen. And it's it's really tough for handrail and, and guardrail. A dumb waiter went down to the cellar. That's the second floor. A child getting in would fall 20 feet, 24 feet. Just close it off. Close it off instantly day one. And it's big how, you know, families are buying this stuff. Yeah, yeah, wall phone kind of dates it, but, you know, went from the second floor down, down to the basement. This is an old set of pull down stairs. That was the weight on, on top, two of them. You know, great system, lasted a long time, but if something goes wrong, you've got, I don't know, 30 pounds. Uh, safety glazing. I think we can get through safety glazing by lunch. Doors, safety glass wasn't required in doors until about 1964. So older doors uh, may not, probably are not safety glass. Near doors, safety glass near stairs, tubs and showers. Temper glass now has an etching on it. Laminated glass, you can't tell. You just can't tell, but any temper glass. But there was a period when they first started making temper glass where they weren't doing the etchings. But if you don't see an etching saying safety glass, assume it's not. Um, my dad was a, a brain surgeon and he put, I had people come up to me. My hand went through the glass door, went to the hospital. Your dad put my nerves back together again. So he but that's why there's safety glass. This is, this is, you know, must do stuff. And uh, used to be able to laminate a plastic to it that was in the code. They pulled that out of the code because it had to be a plastic rated, plastic film rated for it. And nobody was using the right stuff. But um, this here, stairs down, no safety glass. That, that's my house. That still is like that. I'm lucky I can get the door to shut in wintertime. Haven't fallen and gone through it yet, yet. Um, little funky handrail. Man, you can lean on that handrail, and I understand now the value of handrails. Whew, baby. I'm like an old man. Son of a bitch, I am an old man. Um, should be safety glass down at the bottom riser. Should be safety glass like five feet away, three feet away. Should be safety glass adjacent to the storm door. Should be safety glass in the storm door. And you're actually looking at trees. The tops of trees. The tops of pretty big trees. You open that storm door and you're looking at the ground. Oh, yeah. Can't make it up. Can't, you can walk out that door and fall 15 feet. Never got around to doing the stairs. Uh, that's a pretty, pretty big trees you're looking. You know, and this, you just, you scream at your clients. <coughs> Close the door off, board it up, make it absolutely inoperable. We won't do that. How about your nephew, four-year-old, six-year-old nephew visiting? Oh, mommy, look what I can do. Nina, I can lean out this all the way down. You don't want to be on the end of, you're going to get a letter from an attorney at that point. And you're going to wish you had more than the minimum liability. I'm, I'm you know, if you don't, and there is a problem, man, it can be bad. It, it can be bad. How did I get out of presentation mode all of a sudden?
Oh, uh, just the, the button down the bottom, just before you, the, on the right at the bottom, from the, uh, just before that slide yes. thing. Just give that a little bit. Right down the bottom, bottom, the bottom, the bottom, the bottom, the bottom, on here? On here? Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. I'm pushing wrong button, sorry. Um, here, the door opens against the window, so it's protecting the window. But what you can also see is like a nasty four inch riser. You know, I don't know how tall those risers are. And Virginia is still, I think, eight and eight and a half. Everybody else is seven and three quarters. And if um, so if I'm doing an inspection West, if I'd done an inspection West Virginia or Maryland, I'm using the seven and three quarters, Virginia's eight and a half, but they're really tall and that's four inches. No handrail, fall down the stairs, go out the second story window or second and a half story window on, onto the ground. Um, all you need to put a guard across the window. Doesn't even need to be a guard rail, just a guard at like 32 inches high. Adjacent to the tub, next to the tub, and 50s and 60s, all these houses, you had your sink, your toilet, your tub, and the window. They all did. Safety glass, and, and that, you know, that one happened to be a single glazed aluminum window, but just, you know, absolute must, must fixes. Um, shutters can be installed in front of that that do not open. Wooden shutters that are fixed in place that don't open is a workaround. You slip and fall, you hit the wood shutter. You're not hitting the glass, which in this particular house probably isn't safety glass. So somebody slips in that tub, you know, various and sundry parts through the glass, blood everywhere. Um, and yeah, 50s and 60s, man, that was that was all the time. Lunchtime, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, somehow it was brought to my attention in my old house inspection seminar. I used to have a whole section on old house roofing, metal, slate. I lost it. Somehow I lost it. So at one of your meetings, when you find a new meeting site, I will be happy to come and give you my old roof presentation. I'll give you my whole roof presentation. I know where all the slides are. And somehow between exterior and interior, there should have been a roofing section. I'm like, I knew there was something was nagging. Oh, well. However, I'm still going to hit eight hours without any problems. All righty. So what you have in old house, don't have in old houses, that you have in new houses to an nth degree, fire separation issues. And there are many of them garages, multiple occupancies. Oh, when I first started inspecting in New Jersey, again, close to 30 years ago, go up in a row house attic, look and you're just looking both ends of the row, six houses. So, and these were easily hundred years old at that point. If one catches on fire, the whole row goes. Um, those sort of things are difficult to fix. You can maybe build firewalls in your attic on both sides, but the neighbors don't have them. Um, but again, it's just, it's either a like it or don't. If you can accept the house the way it is, as it was built, okay, there are inherent risks to it, or don't buy it. Um, foundations, generally... At foundations, there's not a whole lot of issues with fire separation. Floor framing, wall framing, 
attics and roof structures, you can get into a, a lot of it. Fire blocking and fire safing. And it's like, this is now it's all, I mean, to the nth degree in new construction, but this is not like we just thought of it now. I've got a slide for you that this has been a concern in construction for you know hundreds of years. Pull downstairs in a garage, reaches fire separation. I don't care who wants to argue with me. They do make fire rated pull downstairs are about eight or nine hundred dollars. Uh, very expensive. I have only seen them twice. You can buy a new townhouse in Stephen City, a new house in Stephen City, and they've got a set of pull downstairs in the garage that goes to the HVAC room in the attic. Goes into the attic, and then you walk through the attic to get into the H. So set of pull downstairs, no, no fire separation. Brand new house in Stephen City in a 55 and up community. Um, I, I just, I, I don't understand. Wow. It's a brand new house. The inspector slapping the final inspection sticker on all these friggin' homes. Okay. I mean, it's idiots. It's just idiots. And it's, you know, I don't, I don't. I just don't get it. It's it's horrible. Um, and people, well, what will slap the half inch drywall on the quarter inch? We got, you know, or now it's five eighths on the ceiling. And but it's it's not so much the plywood, but you have a perimeter gap. So when the stairs aren't closed tightly, if the garage door is open and there's a fire in the garage, the heat and pressure just blow right out the door. If the door is closed and there's a fire in the garage and the concern in the garage is gasoline, the heat and pressure, the fire goes through all the small openings like a blowtorch. So blow the car up anyway. Right. Well, if the car blows up, but I mean this is like to spill the gas, whatever. But uh, and and these requirements are not such that the house doesn't ultimately burn down. House may burn down. The object is to provide the occupants enough time to get out. The code cares somewhat about durability, but it's it's about safety, safety of the occupants. It's not that, you know, your fire separation, if there's a spill of gas and a car's there, sooner or later the house is going to just go. But you have enough time to figure out there's fires in the garage, get your butt out of the house. Um, Yes. Yeah. No. Well, it, it should be five eights. If you have five eights type X on the ceiling, which is now I think a requirement in, in garages, they used to allow half inch. I think it's five eights. But if the panel is drywall, fire rated drywall, that's legitimate. If it's a pull down stair, and you know, it, it should theoretically make a reasonable seal at, at the perimeter. Well, they're allowed, and if the, if the building inspector says it's okay, it's okay. I don't care. It's in my report, and if one of these goes up and people are killed and there's a big enough case on it, all of a sudden it will not be allowed. They shouldn't be allowed. They, you know, besides the hazard of how, how they install them. Um, so they're in my report. I don't care what the building inspector says. You know, I don't care. And I've had got one lady took my report, went down to Shenandoah County building, was jumping up and down on the chief inspector's desk. And he basically told her we approved it. You're the home inspector. You're the jerk that just took two weeks in class and you don't know squat. And, you know, you're the idiot you know oh well but i think you know if enough people get you know one of these houses goes up a couple people die all of a sudden 
you know, things will change because I've, I've have seen that, you know, things change usually in, in reaction rather than proactive. Some of the stuff is proactive. A lot of it's re reactive. Um, this is in Winchester again. You actually had two beauty salons. Somehow there's a third. This was connected to it. An apartment, a couple of apartments above, an office, all kinds of stuff. And so here I'm in one attic looking into the next attic. So basically, again, if something like this catches fire, the whole place is, is up. Um, Nice gutter job, by the way. All she can do is put it in your report, let people know, and leave them, you know, figure out what they want to do about it. In a lot of cases, you know, you just, you can't fix it. It's either a like, a like it or don't. Here, single wall pipe, what's that, six inches if it's gas? to combustible material. It's almost touching the joist before it goes into the old unlined chimney. In your report, fire stopping, fire safing, uh, repairs and improvements. You can make bad situations better many times, simply and easily. All right, how, how many of you put the open tub drain in your report as a fire issue? How many of you do it every time? Every time you see it? All of you? Well, let's change that today. Fire in the basement, in the tub, in the walls, house is on fire. Every one of these should be in your report. Every single one of them. And I know you all see them multiple times a week. Um, must do stuff. This is fire. It's, you don't build them like you used to. So that holds an open fire. That, that's a connection between floors that will allow a fire in the basement to get up. And it's under the tub. So you know you've got open walls with no drywall. So it's going up there. And every single one of those is a fire safety issue. Shane. Absolutely. Which issue did I speak? No. You're going to seal around the pull down ladder? How are you going to pull the ladder down? Uh, and I'm answering into mess and caulk fills a gap. Okay. Then you've sealed it shut. Well, if you're going to do that, take the friggin' ladder out and put a big drywall hatch up there. If you put a big dry, uh, two foot by five foot drywall hatch up there, a little tough to lift it, got the fire separation, yank the stairs out and put a drywall hatch in. Into mess and caulk is not, is, is not going to address that. But uh, actually, good, good thought. On the, same, on the same issue, what is the best way to report the issue of the pull down? How would be a way to write that out? Fire separation. Breach of fire separation between the garage and, you know, the attic, the whatever's, whatever it's going up to. It's, it's the fire separation. It's a breach of the fire separation. The next thing was the silicone better seal. Okay, so the answer Pull downstairs in garages, unless they are rated for, unless they are rated as a fire separating pull down set of steps which again is about an $800 set of steps, not an $80 set of steps, breach the fire separation. End of statement, nothing can make that better, in my opinion. Again, Stephen City, Arlington. And the, the last thing from my line was, building that you talk about that can catch fire, <laughs> did catch fire about a year ago, so. <laughs> That one. That one? I'm assuming based on the statements here, yep. <laughs> well, I warned them. I told them. I told them. <laughs> no, I told them it's in their damn report. Oh, man. I was an investor, too. Uh, buying up all kinds of these properties. Um, it's in, it was in their report screaming. 
screaming. Thank you. Oh yeah. Um, you know, I think it did. I think I remember hearing about that. And I know it's, it's a reasonably common issue, but they're all fire issues. And that, if you're inspecting a new house, is that what you see in a new house? Why not? <laughs> no, nah, finished or unfinished. They're all sealed. They're all sealed. Yeah, it should be the red foam. Red foam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And why? That's it. And that, but they didn't worry about it until 15 years ago. I started to see, and I found it in a custom home that was built that wasn't caught by the county inspector. They've got all these 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 wafer thin um, LED uh, recess lights. Yeah, you know, they're just attached to a box, and they're plastic. And uh, you know, um, oh, it was a cover on the electrical box. No, it's on this recess light on the ceiling of the garage. Oh, okay, and okay. Or like well, this. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Recess lights in a garage. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, they are not fire rated. Reset. And, uh, yeah, no, yes, yeah. correct. Also, HVAC in a garage. Nope. Nope. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I have earned my money today because I have at least two thirds of you are now putting that in your report. They do it every day in new construction, just chop up a piece of aluminum, kind of funk it in there. And then get that red foam caulk and fill in every hole you can see. It not rockets are, yeah. And I mean, even ply aluminum's what you usually see, just pieces of flashing material. Wood would probably work, but the key is filling all those little bitty gaps with that. With with the uh, and yeah, you take a hunk of that red foam caulk and you cannot set that in fire you can't budge that stuff with a flame i don't know if you took a torch to it probably not and again you know you see this every single old house and so and i don't know i was 10 so i was inspecting close to 30 years probably 15 years before i find before you know the light bulb went on but for the last 15 years every single one of those and again, people look at you like, huh? Who reports on that? That's, you know, you just, the fire downstairs just has its way. You know, you're looking at the walls and and the plumbing vent pipe goes up around that. No fire safe around the vent pipes. So that's way for the hot, that fire in the basement can chase its way sooner or later up into the attic. Um, your old houses, the closet walls, they're open down, you know. Um, piece of drywall just drop down over top that with some uh sealing or caulk not really a fire stop but a draft stop you're limiting the ability if if the heat can't get out the top of the chase the fire's not going to want to go up in the fire's looking for areas of low pressure to move out into as the fire heats the air it builds up pressure so the air is looking to move from high pressure to low pressure so if it's sealed you know, with almost anything, you're limiting the ability of the fire to spread and giving the peep, the occupants of the home time to get out. That's what it's all about, safety. Oops. Here, this is 50s, 60s, your kitchen soffit. And again, you're looking into the wall framing. Um, zero insulation. Stuff the stud cavities with insulation cut pieces of drywall just drop them in and glue them whatever to the top plates put insulation back on top and the people will get their money back for the improvement in their energy bill i mean that's a pay for itself and you know where you're going to have a fire and 
best place in the house for a fire, most likely place for a house and a fire is the kitchen. And, and oh, the kitchen exhaust hoods that just vent into the attic, just horrible. Okay, that, that's worse than the, than the sun trap. Yep. Yep. Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. This is over a kitchen. Oh, yeah, this is bad. This is bad. I mean, but your, you know, your, your levels of badness. This is kind of bad. You see it every day. This is rare, but worse. But this is fire separation is life safety. It's people getting out of the house or not getting out of the house. What I like to bring up when the client says, well, can you give me like an order of like, where is it better so I know the order to fix that? I said, yes, it's in my report and you should fix that. <laughs> All the things in the report are bad. Fix those things. Some are worse. Some are worse. And and you want your you your job is to help your clients understand what are the you know, what's the day one stuff. This might not be day one, but pretty pretty high on the list um and i remember again doing inspections in cherry hill new jersey being in the attic and saying man i can look all the way down alongside the chimney down into the basement isn't that great and it probably took me five or ten years before i finally figured out not so great oh yeah self-taught inspector you started inspecting when the heck 93 you want to be a home inspector? You're a home inspector. I mean, I had construction background, but you know the amount of knowledge that you need to know on a daily basis to do your job properly as a home inspector is is phenomenal. But here, just you know, piece of aluminum, jam, fiberglass in there. Now, fiberglass lets air through, lousy and insulating. But if you jam it in there such that you squeeze all the air out. You're at least providing a draft stop. Rock rock wool's ideal because it won't burn, but right now you got nothing. Rock wool is hard to get your hands on, but you know, um, sheet metal, anything. You're just you're you're a draft stop. Not you know, if the fire is going to get through sooner or later, it's going to get through. But rock wool, jam fiberglass tight, even plywood with with caulk, um, nickel dime stuff nickel dime stuff um same thing looking all the way down the chimney the fireplace and chimney diagonal in the building nice but it left all these sort of things um i highly recommend that's my foot that those shoes clark wallabies crepe soles they don't track dirt they're really comfy i'm not getting paid i used the dark ones because they wouldn't show all the dirt and stuff um, here, this was the motel that, that caught fire and they tore the hole inside out. I just didn't find, but where'd that fire start? I kind of think maybe there was an electrical issue there and it just chased up and out and somehow got into the room because I can't really see how a fire in the room would have been coming out the switch box. I mean, obscure possibly but i think an electrical fire and it just gets and it just starts you know following all these you know what a how you can just you can kind of follow the path of the fire by looking at the soot there and it's pushing its way in in all kinds of places and this motel had there were like three rooms that it had fires in it um, you know, 50s or 60s motel in Front Royal, lots of transients and people smoking in bed and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Cooking all kinds of interesting stuff. Um, protecting the wires. But again, all these are little bitty chases, part of the motel that didn't have the fire immediately in it. Balloon framing. This is the big sill. These are your studs that run all the way up to the roof, unless there's a window or door. So all these are little chimneys. The balloon frame houses, if there's a fire in the cellar underneath them, it just chases up the walls and the houses explode in flames. Just jam and insulation in every one of those. The draft stop. 
you know, limit the ability of the fire to get into all those little chimneys around the perimeter of the house will again, greatly slow the path of the fire. House may still burn, but the people got out. Illustration out of the 1905 book. Fire underneath into the balloon framing, going all the way up in the wall, but here it's showing burning the floors out under the bedroom. So these techniques, these issues were known how to address it. You can have a wooden block. You can fill the whole thing with concrete. You can put some bricks in. So the issues were known. This is, you know, not this, this was, you know, two pages. I just jammed the two pictures on the one page, but the problem was known 1905 and how to address it was known. And this is how you should build a house, but you know, it just wasn't, wasn't done. Here again, you can see, you get the fire in the wall, up, 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 up into the attic and through the floor framing. Beautiful house they tore down. Plaster walls, you can have plaster on wood lath, gypsum lath, you can have plaster directly on masonry and problems. Plaster cracks. Plaster really cracks. I think that's my house. We did not do that abysmal texture. Um, and the texture makes it virtually impossible to actually fix the cracks. There's a company now that makes some stuff, comes in like 54 inch wide rolls that you can, basically you spread a paste out on that, you roll this material across all these rotten ceilings and they look great. It can be, painted and so there's products out there that can um, really work super. Uh, magazine, old house journal, if you have a client buying one of these houses and they don't know, even if they do know, tell them subscribe to old house journal if for nothing else but the ads. But there's just all kinds of, all kinds of ways to help people deal with the issues that you find. This again is, is our house. We just installed shelving in front of that. I never fixed the plaster. We tore that out to get I think communications up to the second floor from my office. But this is a hand split wood lath where somebody was sitting out there in the yard on a tree stump with a hatchet and a tree and making that stuff. It's not the sawn lath, that's hand split. Um, the worst job on the carpentry crew was the guy that nailed that lath on the house. I mean, the saw sharpener. Guy sat in the yard and sharpened the saws, had a better job than the guy that nailed the lath on. Those nails are little bitty nails, sharp as the devil. We're getting into electrical. This is not the electrical, but it was an amazing shot because the house had never been insulated. But the scratch coat, is the first coat of the three coat plaster pushed on the lath and mushed through and it would fall over and set. And the fallen over plaster on the top of the lath is what holds the plaster on the lath. So, and they're the keys. When the keys in the plaster break, then the plaster falls. But that's, and then your second, your first coat is the scratch coat. They would put that on, they would literally scratch it. Then there's a brown coat, which got them pretty good. And then, then the finish coat. And you can't take a plaster ceiling down and put drywall up without straightening the ceiling first because they weren't concerned with, you know, how straight and level and all that stuff was because they were straightening it out with the plaster. If you take the plaster down, you have to straighten that ceiling, shim it, fur it, whatever, and get all that straight and then put your drywall up. Other your drywall will just look abysmal. So a question that came in, the pictures you had there, you said you got a book. Mm -hmm. uh, which book were you referencing? It was the one I showed right in the beginning, Practical Heart House Carpentry, I believe. Um, there's a whole bunch of those books just went up for auction in Stephen City, but they went for 80 to 100 bucks a piece. So I didn't get any more of them, but they're 
Oh yeah. Um, all this stuff has been known and it's, you know, you had to learn to read. And man, I had a master carpenter in my construction company could build a curved set of circular steps was almost illiterate, but man, he could, he could figure and do math that, I mean, truly amazing. But most of his stuff he did without, without tape measures. Your plumbing, material, supply and drains, galvanized, cast iron, lead, copper, and brass. Um, galvanized, typical life expectancy, 30 to 40 years, really hasn't been used for plumbing for 60 years. So pretty much all of it is beyond its life expectancy. Orangeburg sewer line is a terrible problem in a lot of neighborhoods, but you have no way of knowing. But uh, if And if you're inspecting in a neighborhood that has Orangeburg pipe and you do repeated inspections, you'll find out how many people have actually replaced it. Uh, because it basically taught asphalt and uh, cardboard for main sewer drain lines. Just miserable stuff it was cheap. Galvanized. Again, whenever I see it, no matter what it's used, limited life expectancy. Um, might chug along for decades in the future. Might die tomorrow. And, you know, I've had... People say, well, you told us we moved in in a week. We had to, you know, the bathroom, no sign of leaking, no problems. A week later, it just, it let loose. Um, galvanized corrodes on the inside first and builds up debris and rust nodules that limit the flow of the water. So when you're in a house with galvanized supply, just turn all the fixtures on and see what happens to the upstairs tub or shower with multiple fixtures running. Um, it just rusts through. So it has long-term problems and it has short-term problems. And basically, you know, monitor and replace or just replace, depending. If you're looking at this stuff, just replace. Don't even bother monitoring. Just get it out of there as quickly as possible. Here you've got cast iron, and you also have two drain pipes exiting. That one's black water, this one's gray water. They're both headed out kind of in the same direction, but if they were both going to the same spot, why wouldn't they have just run one pipe out? Because maybe the gray water's not going where the black water is. Maybe, you don't know, but raise the question. Let somebody else do some further investigation. The sewer scope, they got all kinds of magic, magic tricks that can find more additional, you know, more information for your clients, which you're not necessarily doing, but you're pointing them in the direction. Um, and I've seen one gorgeous mansion in West Virginia. The main drain was just coming right out into the creek. All the sewage in the house just right in the creek. Okay, 200 years, it wasn't even okay 200 years ago, but you know, and this was being sold that way. And like, I think you're gonna wind up having to do something here. Main drain was running out of the house and we saw it terminate outside in a creek. Can't make it up. Main drain in a creek. Yes, sir. Some of the guys who are not very realty. I inspected the house, the power burst only when they were there. The drain right from the back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and a lot of homes, 50s and 60s, the laundry was out in the yard. Do the wash before you do your exterior, you know, run the washer before you do your exterior inspection. You know, you're out in the country, you see this more often than not. And a lot of times kitchens were not put in. They do a separate, you know, the grease 
and the laundry detergents, particularly with all the phosphates that used to be in the laundry detergent, were not good for the bacteria in the septic system or cesspool or whatever the black water was going into. So running the kitchen and the laundry into, uh, I've seen them where at least days four, there was this whole separate drain field for that. Or, you know, run the washer and you got a wet spot in the yard and it hasn't rained. We'll go back inside and run the washer again and stand there when it when it pumps out and put it in the you know put it in the main drain that's all you do today it just all all the sewage has to go in the sewer or or the septic there are no exceptions to that lead drains uh people get you know conceivably could get all worked up i got lead i got lead drain pipes that's a water leaving the house not a problem not a problem other than it's probably eroded and ready to fail and all that stuff. But this was, I mean, plumbers really, you know, these are all hand, these are all site made joints where they would, you know, meld it just enough and wipe the joints and, and really an art. Uh, there's lead trap there. So if they're draining the washer into that laundry sink, um, problems with supplies and drains, corrosion, erosion, where the corrosion is rust, erosion is the piping material literally just gets carried away over time by the water, like the Grand Canyon. Mixed metals, galvanic action, where you connect copper and uh, steel or galvanize together, the steel loses, so the copper will aggravate the deterioration of the steel. Freezing, awful lot of that uh, around here. Insulation on the pipes, heat tape. Uh, the system, uh, high efficiency HVA systems in the attics with the heat tapes on the condensate drains and stuff, man, they're just Problems waiting to happen. It's like, let's get past the five-year warranty and good luck. Oh, not this session, but if you read the fine print, the label on the heat tape, it says plug it into a ground fault receptacle. And the receptacles in the attics by the furnace for the heat tape most times are not ground faults. Just take a picture of it, put it in your report. Signs of problems and failure, sometimes they're visible. When you're inspecting old plumbing, don't push, turn, or touch anything except hot and cold water faucets and check fixtures for stability. You rock the toilet, lean on the toilet, the pedestal sinks, try them gently first. Don't say, oh, oh damn. They're really heavy on your toes. But all these other valves, just no touchy. Do not touch. Here's your main water shutoff valve. Let's see if it works. No, sir. Nope. Nope. Once it's your house, you can do that all you want, but we're not touching that today. How do we know it works? We don't. It's an old galvanized valve. It probably doesn't work, but if you touch it and it leaks, I ain't paying the plumber and you're not touching it. Just don't. Just don't. And grab your clients, tell your clients, no, you're responsible for the fools in the house with you. Mixed metals, you can see the galvanized, there was a repair on that anyhow, it's, it's going. Look, but don't touch. Oh, look, look, there's a leak, ha! Water's running down your arm. I speak from personal experience. Had that happen? Look, tell them, this isn't repair, this is replace. This is fail. This is not an if. This is failed, it needs to be replaced immediately because when it decides to just let loose full tilt, it will let loose full tilt until you turn the water off. And, you know, and then call the plumber out but in, in a cellar like this, it's, you know, it's relatively easy. They just take it all out and put new plastic back. But don't, don't touch those. Don't, 
don't touch them. Um, fragile as can be. Here again, this is that motel. You can see the cysts on the bottom. So the guy buying it, going to make all these lovely one bedroom high. I don't, I don't, well, actually I'm talking to the choir, you know, expensive one bedroom, high dollar, like apartments. That's what like life is about in a lot of places out here, but this guy's trying it in front Royal, you know? Oh yeah. By the way, you're going to have to replace all the plumbing in, in the property. Really? Yeah. Yep. 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 So Yeah sister starting so the cast iron's failing now one or two of these guys you can knock that little bump off and a little two-part epoxy or something and nurse the stuff along but maybe not oh isn't this quaint we love that we're going to keep it uh -huh. maybe not maybe not that was the ceiling under that i think we need a little bit of work here Oh, nice copper. Nope. Galvanized in the floor. And if this is galvanized, pretty much that tub drain's galvanized too. Um, cast iron typically goes 60 to 80 years, except Winchester, Virginia. I've seen a ton of, at this point, it's probably 50 to 60 year old cast iron just absolutely fail. I think they bought a train load of bad cast iron and put it in all these houses built in the 70s and 80s. And it's it's all failing. And I've, I have not seen that outside of Winchester, but you know, this is, you know, it's, it's failed. Must've had some sort of problem because they went down the cellar. There was actually finished rooms down there, the office building with the lean and chimney. There's all these little bitty flies. Where the heck are all these flies coming from? Yeah, maybe there. That's the main drain leaving the building. You know, that's in service. That's the main, that's the main drain leaving the building with, I don't know, for some reason, somebody felt the need to bap a hole in it. Maybe it wasn't draining too well out to the street. It, 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 oh, uh, clean out or dirty in, one of the two, depending. New copper water service, we were happy about that. Again, just look subtle. Sometimes you actually see a crack in the cast iron, but the cysts are, are pretty common. A lovely repair, zip tie. Um, the vertical are less likely to fail than the horizontal, but the vertical does fail. Brass trap deterioration. Now here it's going to a lead drain and a cast iron drain. Now you have a lot of these homes, you've got cast iron under the, the basement floors. What's its life expectancy? No idea, just run like these laundry sinks, just run them, run them, run them, run them, run them, run them a long time. All the houses with older drain piping supplying the drain piping, run those fixtures. I mean, just, just run them a while. Uh, with the, you're not trying to build the drain up, water up in them, just let them run down the drain. Make sure the drain takes the water and look under all these things. Look, run the water first and then go down the basement. Look at the cast iron, the stuff running right a couple inches off the floor. Look under it, I got tagged on that. My third inspection, you know, went down the basement first, inspected all this stuff, and there was a crack on the bottom of the cast iron. Learn, these are just yank them, replace them with plastic. Oh, it's not leaking yet. Don't touch it. You put your finger right through that stuff. That's hair, that's paper thin. That's paper thin. Don't touch this stuff. Old house. No trap, but I had no idea until we pulled that vanity door open that they repiped it with polybutylene. So a new issue introduced into an old house. Toilet in the corner of another bathroom, there's a stinking poly sticking up out of the floor. How much is in the house? Well, 
We have it in this one bathroom here, and we have it in that one bathroom way the heck over there. So I suspect. No, nope, no, nope. uh, no hint of polybutylene in this house until I open that bathroom vanity door. I mean, you can say homemade vanity, but nope. Ah, surprise, 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 as Mr. Pyle would say. But don't miss that stuff. Antique drain piping, traps, venting, problems, S trap. These were in the code. West Virginia allowed them till the mid 90s, mid, no, late 90s, early 2000s. Then they finally said no S traps. But these can all be upgraded with the air admittance valves. So this probably works, might not be a problem, but for X amount of dollars, you can just replace all this with an air admittance valve. And new construction, that's all you see, right? You got one inch and a half pipe through the roof and everything else is air admittance valves. So they're great, they work. This is a drum trap, like the lead drum trap we saw. These were, you know, they're pretty common. You could catch stuff, clean them out and things, but required maintenance. You had to clean them out on a somewhat regular basis. So they're all, all the traps you see now are, are self-scouring. The water just keeps them clean. This, all the drain piping that we could see was all, all brass, lovely, but, you know, very finite life. Vent location, it's supposed to be 12 inches from the wall, dormer wall, but at least you got a vent. Here, at least you got a vent, but it's supposed to be up above the roof. Two lines leaving. One's going to the septic or whatever is in place of the septic. The other's going somewhere else, but pretty sure it's not going into the uh, main sewage. Cast iron galvanized was legitimately connected. This, I think, was a conditioner brine drain. Bap the hole in the cast iron in the crawl space and put the conditioner brine drain into the sewer line. Direct connection between your drinking water and the sewer. I thought that was kind of bad. I mean, two young girls buying this house in Front Royal. Little nice little two bedroom ramble, little tiny house, nice, pretty reasonable. Go in the crawl space. Must have had a little problem with the main drain leaving the house. How do we fix it? Nah, pull the clean out off. Leave the sewage back up into the friggin' crawl space. And spread a little lime around because it probably was not the most pleasant thing. And that's, what, a five, ten, fifteen thousand dollar $15,000 fix? So needless to say, two young women starting out did not buy that house. I have other issues, but this was like, I, you know, that, was that photograph I took, that's, you know, there's the wall, that's the dirt. It just like, you know, you just want to come out screaming. Um, and, you know, and, and if you miss that, look for another profession, you know? You're doing the wrong thing. But yeah, just just horrible, you know, and just horrible. Old outhouse, effective. Um, I have seen two churches in one was Shenandoah County. I can't remember the other one was with men and women outhouses. And these are, you know, today, this is like, not, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now this, my wife dragged me over to England or Ireland. This is the outhouse. Well, you're still inside, but that's where you sat down to relieve yourself. Advantages to everything, almost everything. 
coated the walls with slime. So an invader trying to climb those, a lot of problems. You, you can't make this stuff up. Got the stuff out of the building on the side of the window right next to it. I wouldn't be sleeping in that room next to that window, but um, this is a house that I had. Oh yeah, this is the uh, gorgeous brick, uh, stone and brick and garage addition and stuff. This is the pool. We're gonna get that pool going. Just needs a little work. And you don't inspect pools. Okay, disclaim it. Okay, fine. But, and certainly I wasn't going to inspect it because it's not working. But the deck around it looked a little funky. Tad funky. So let's back up two slides. We see the pool. We see a concrete apron. We see a deck. Then we go around in the yard. Look underneath it, that deck don't look too good. Concrete looks worse. I was built on fill and the fill settled what? Eight, 12 inches away from the concrete, which is what's holding. So, I, you know, I told my client, I know you would like to fix this pool, but you just take it away. And if you want a pool, Get the engineer out to engineer the whole thing and put a new pool back. That's all right. We'll work with it. In my report, screaming bloody murder about it. Oh, and, and all these pools. You walk out the house, you go in the pool. Okay, you got the nice fence keeping the neighbor's kid maybe from getting in it. What about your kids? This is stupid. You need a damn fence around the whole pool between the house and the pool. Because that's the little kid gets out of the house and gets in the pool. Well, if you don't have a little kid, not your kid, somebody visiting, this is screaming stuff. Um, all righty. Uh, wells and cisterns. Outside, isn't this quaint? We used to get our water from there, and now we have it coming from the city. That's great. What about the six-year-old kid? There you go. Got your little switch between dumping the water outside the foundation and having it in the cellar or drum, drop it into the cistern, pop the lid off the cistern, a few feet down into a body of water. That's like, that's, an, that's what the attorneys call an attractive nuisance. You're inviting the six-year-old to fall in there and drown. Little gazebo out in the yard. Ah, cistern. And if they're sitting out of the ground like this, you're pretty sure they're cisterns, not septics. Because if it was septic, a cistern is drinking water. A septic is sewage. So if they're sitting with a lid like this, you're pretty sure they're drinking water. Pull the lid back and look. But that'll be typically drinking water because your septic tanks are buried because you don't really, because they stink. Um, but yeah, little kid with a little initiative gets that off and they're into a, a tank of water and who's going to hear them yell? Yeah, yeah. This was in a crawl space. Somehow you got into the crawl space from the house. Take concerted effort to slide that off. But if somebody did, I slid it off. Um, this is a board well, which in my opinion doesn't meet current standards where you have basically an impervious casing, usually a six inch steel casing down into rock. This is a series of like two foot diameter concrete pipe, just like sewer pipe now or stormwater drain pipe. So there's no sealing of the joint. So whatever gets into the surface water gets into the groundwater and can get into the well. Um, there's entire areas where it's all 
uh, board wells outside of Richmond. And I did one inspection, told the client, doesn't meet current standards. And apparently you can still put them in Richmond. I, I'm not quite sure about that, but um, the client didn't buy the house. They didn't want that risk. And the seller's just yelling at me, I'm going to sue you. You killed my deal. You know, this well is legitimate. That got a county permit to put it in. But he had a little shed right next to that. It was filled with all his lawnmower equipment and gas tanks and oil and all. You could see all the stuff spilled in there. So I said, well, did you get a permit for that shed? He didn't actually need a permit for the shed, but whatever's in that shed is in that well. And never heard from him again. Now, I wasn't going to let my client drink whatever you spilled on the ground in your shed. Right. I mean, it was the well was right behind behind that. And that was how it was. It was built. So. But again, you go around Richmond, you see in the front yards, all these, you know, two foot concrete pipes coming out of the ground with a lid. That's a board well. Somebody might eventually have to get into that well to replace whatever is in the well pit, like the pump. Tell them don't send the 300 pound plumber over. Mm -hmm. Cause he ain't gonna, he or she ain't gonna fit. Board well in a basement. And apparently this was to a church. And also, I mean, you can just, most of this is water-based stuff now, but you know, all this stuff, that's the drinking water for the house, but also the church next door. Well, apparently the church was built first with the board well, they decided they want a house there. They just put the house, Loudoun County, Waterford, as a matter of fact built the house around the well. And so the well served both the church and the house. And again, and I, yeah, the church had me in to inspect the whole place. And I said, you know, I don't know what you're going to want to do, but you want to do something. Yes, middle of Waterford. And I better not say, but I, wasn't Catholic. There's no Catholic church. There's only one church in Middle Waterford that I know of, I think. Um, this was slide deck cover back. We're looking into that. So secure the cover. But this is a drilled well, so we're kind of happy about that. But you see the well casing come up about three inches and the wire going down in there for the pump and stuff like that. Well, once you fill that pit with six inches of water and the top of the well casing is three inches above the pit, you now have whatever is in the yard and whatever is in that pit in the well, which is then being pumped in the house as drinking water. It is drinking water. Easy fix, 500 to 1,000 bucks for that. They just take plastic pipe and a fern cove fitting, bring it up above grade, do the two piece fitting through the side of it, all done, better. You now have a modern well. So relatively inexpensive fix, but these are you know really common in, in the country. Um, very, very common. This was the same thing where the house was, this was expensive estate somewhere. South of me, big expensive house right on the river outside of Edinburgh, I think maybe. And this was the well, uh, somebody had to take us there. This was like 150 feet from the house. You looking for a break time? 245, uh, ragged. Um, found this, said, okay, here's the well. Okay, we're, you know. This was keeping the pipes from freezing. And the you know, light bulb burns out. Ah, easy to solve today. You just put an LED bulb in there. That'll keep the pipes from freezing, right? Save energy too. We will see this slide again later. We have other issues there, but there's, you know, there's the wellhead, the wire going down, the water coming out. 
If you ever wondered what a hand dug well looks like, there it is. That again is Waterford. Yeah. How many people, how many slaves died? You know, wasn't, well, might've been a poor white guy, but yeah, hand dug. Hand dug and lined with stone. Yes, Fernando. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I'd forgotten about that. Yeah, pull away the carpet. There's a the well under the living room floor. And the well was there first, then they put the house there, you know, like that, like at the church. Really wells go down how deep in this area. Till they hit the water. And then what's the minimum? There, there kind of isn't any. Well, you can have shallow wells. Our house had a spring. The water just comes out of the ground. They had a pump pumped into the house. We had about 50 gallons of water in our cistern. Usually when you have a cistern, there's a well feeding the cistern, and the cistern is the reservoir. There is no... Is it a tank at the bottom of this, where these pipes go through? Where no, no, no. This is an old hand, hand dug well. Where does the pipe go? How do they get raw water? With a pump. There's your... And there's a filter on it? It's like up there? Uh, there can be, there should be a foot, what they call a foot on it that gets clogged readily. I, I talk from, we, yeah, we bought our house. It was a spring with a pump. We put a well in like first thing and our well is in a spring. So we have a little pool of water around our well. Cause they drill, we've got like springs all over our property. Um, but no, this, this is a hand dug well. I mean, and again, life was, was, was cheap. Because, you know, they didn't dig down and just, you know, they must have had a bigger hole. And they started just putting and putting rocks back. Waterford, it's rocks all over the place. And you just put rocks back and put the dirt in around it and more rocks and more dirt until you back up to the top again. And that's when you had the bucket and the, and the crank. I mean, that's what you used to do. Um, and when you're looking at a, in an old house, you will occasionally you know, see a hand dug well. That's how, you know, that's how I got that photo. I have not run into many of them, but that was just, you know, I knew that was going into my presentations. All righty. Um, any, any questions on that at all? Um, city water, you don't see any of that, but you get out into the, well, Great Falls, Great Falls, giant houses, and you know the waters. It, it's just where where the water table is, where how far down you have to go to hit water. Again, our we had, a, you know, we literally were getting water from a spring where we weren't in the ground. The water just flows continuously. It's the was the moonshiners' house. They needed privacy. They needed water, and so we had you know, a spring where they always had fresh water, but we put a well in 145 deep, relatively shallow well, hit bedrock. And again, now our well, when we have a lot of rain, our well is artesian. We can turn the pump off and the water comes up the well casing and into the house uh, just with the ar artesian pressure. And, and our well is in a spring because we have a small pond by the well casing but they did theoretically seal it with with bentonite when they drilled the well but there's so much water we live at the bot not at the bo total bottom of the valley but the hollow drains our hollow drains through our property so i've got you know three four five six springs um and literally a bog in our front yard a swamp in our front yard so lack of water is not you know 30 to 40 gallons a minute they guess when they drilled the well Dave, is there any rule of thumb for doing an inspection on a house for the well? Um, how much water you want to run just to see how fresh it holds up and stuff like that? No, and I've heard people guess at that. 
don't even don't even get into it. I mean, if you're running stuff and all of a sudden the well runs dry, oh, there's low yield welds that you can run a house with a well that produces like a gallon or two gallons a minute. And they've got the little pressure switch on the well equipment with a little switch on it. There's a cutout. If you run the well out of water, the pressure switch cuts the power off to the pump so you don't burn the pump out. You just have to wait until it refills. We were doing that a little bit with our spring till we figured out we had like, we couldn't like water the lawn with a spring. <laughs> You know, it just doesn't work for irrigation. Um, I have seen a number of wells, but basically send somebody into the county to get the, when the well driller drills a well, they file a certificate of completion and the it'll give a lot of specifications how deep it is, what type of rock they went through. But the most important number on that is the yield, the estimated gallons per minute. Um, you can run a house on a gallon and a half or two gallons a minute, particularly now with your low flow fixtures, but two or three fixtures at once, it, it just doesn't support that. Um, some wells, our well is 30 to 40 gallons a minute. We can, you know, all the water we want, um, but there's no, there's no guessing. Shane. We had a question come in. He said, I saw a well being dug in Nicaragua. It was 300 feet deep. They were lowering the guy down with a rope with a bucket. What happens when they hit the aquifer? They fall into the water. Yep. And he said, You know. Yep. It's warm, though. It's warm. They ain't freezing. They dig. And how many guys? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's how that hand dug well was, was, was dug. In Waterford, that's how they're, you know, you got to get to the water and you keep digging until you hit the water and then you go a little bit more till you get enough water and then you stop digging and you start putting the rocks back in the hole so it doesn't collapse. Yeah, uh, you can go six or 700 feet and then that's about the limit of depth that a, a pump, um, I don't know it's limited by the pump. I think it's limited by the pressure. The, you, you, your pressure in a, in a 600 foot deep well in, in the pipe that the pump's got to produce, your pipe's just going to explode. In, in the mountains, yeah. Yeah. Um, you can have them 600 feet. You can have them 600 feet deep. Yeah. I'm 600 feet from the ridge. I'm 290 and I have yeah yeah it's just you know if you hit the right crack in the bedrock i've seen them on blue mountain new house they would drill one well and just dry they went down 600 feet got nothing they moved to 10 feet and hit like 10 gallons a minute yeah it's you know it's just the um dowser and i've seen plumbers with dowsing rods on the back I, I can't say that it doesn't work, but yeah, 600 feet, nothing, move it 10 feet, 10 gallons a minute. You know, they were like three or 400 feet down, but the first well, they didn't get anything. So it's, you hit the crack in the bedrock that's got the water. Um, so well drillers will give you a price per foot of drilling and a price per foot of the casing, but they won't say it's going to be $3,000 to drill your well. You know, they just won't. Uh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. What, 10 minutes? 10 minutes. Um, thank you. Sure. So for those online, uh, just a reminder, please keep your cameras off as um, that'll help a lot with the bandwidth. Thank you very much. And we'll be back at 255. All righty, gentlemen and ladies. Yes, sir. Minute and a half. Uh, I have a friend who um, 
is looking for a um, yeah, kind of one bedroom apartment kind of a thing in Northern Virginia. He's saying Manassas, um, Chantilly, and Fern, Fern and Ruston area. All righty, here we go. Water heaters over 40 years old. If you're looking at a water heater that old, it's usually with the space heating boiler and there are usually problems with it. The problems can be TPR devices, efficiency, temperature regulation, capacity or duration, corrosion and asbestos. Capacity or duration are, uh, you familiar with the winter summer hookups and the oil fire boilers where they would put a little coil for the domestic hot water in the oil boiler? Well, they have a tendency to lime up. So you can get boiler temperature water, which depending on the radiators is 120 to 160 or 70 degrees. And you can get insanely scalding water. And then if the boiler, if the coil gets encrusted with lime, you'll get scalding water and then no water within about a two or three minute period. Um, so the water that gets heated, gets heated to the boiler temperature, runs out the pipes. And then it, the theory is that with the boiler running and you need to keep your boiler running all summer for the hot water, the water coming through that coil will get heated, but when it's coated with lime, it doesn't heat. So basically yank it, put an electric hot water heater in. The scalding can be addressed with the tempering valves, which you now see on tubs or any fixture with that does not have a, a temperature uh, control built into it. But the uh, winter summer hookups, just yank it, put an electric water heater in, and you don't have to run the boiler all summer to get your hot water. So you'll get your money back very, very quickly. This is, they call them a sidearm water heater. Again, there's a coil in the boiler that runs through the tank that is coated with what? No, absolutely not. It is, well, no. Are you licensed in Virginia to say the word asbestos? No. Ah, then that is not asbestos. And I've been on the board. That is a suspected asbestos containing material testing and remediation recommended. That would be in my report. I, that's what's in my report. Now it can be encapsulated, it can be remediated. Um, and I know it's asbestos, but Unless you are licensed in Virginia, not as a remediator, but as an asbe uh, asbestos has got, being on the board of asbestos, lead asbestos and home inspectors, I learned a ton about asbestos. Um, oh, there's like four or five licenses within, or six or seven licenses within asbestos. It's, phew, it's amazing. Um, but unless you have a license to test that and do a test and determine conclusively that it is asbestos, you can't say it's asbestos. And some people will say it's like mold. You can't say the word mold. Yes, you can, but you couch it properly. A biological organism, who's gonna help write biological organism? It's suspected mold testing and remediation suspected asbestos containing material. And I tell my clients, I know it's asbestos, but I can't put it in the report, it's asbestos. It can be encapsulated, but why would you want to encapsulate that when you have this huge tank of water that's no temperature control and it costs, you got to run your boiler all summer to get that tank full of water and asbestos remediation 
on uh, uh, Scott Truax's neighbor of mine said, well, they're doing a Habitat for Humanity house and they got one pipe in the crawl space with this much stuff. And he said, is it asbestos? I said, I don't know. Best I can say is it might be asbestos containing material. And I'm not looking at this. And he says, well, we'll just take it out. This is a house you're going to rehab for Habitat for Humanity. You are not going to take it out. You are going to call an asbestos remediation contractor, have them evaluate, have them test, have them take it out for six stinking feet of this stuff. You do not want to be holding the hand. And also, they're going to do testing of all the soil because you got six feet of asbestos. How much has been taken off? We'll see plenty of asbestos slides. Um, got to be a licensed person. And it's, it's not that expensive in Virginia. I'm from New Jersey where everything costs $10,000 with this, like the underground oil tanks. It all costs thousands of thousands of dollars. And Virginia, it's not that much. You know, huh, one house, all hot water pipes loaded with asbestos. Remediation company came in, cleaned it out couple 3,000 bucks, and that was through a crawl space, big crawl space, but, you know, New Jersey, it would have been $25,000. I mean, just just simply the liability, the work's the same, the liability is, is insane in New Jersey because everybody wants to sue everybody. Um, but there's no reason in the world to leave that tank. There's many reasons. So you could encapsulate it, but it's, it's costing a huge amount of money for the hot water, no temperature regulation, just get rid of it, put in an electric water heater and, you know, well, we're, we're going to get the boilers too. Yeah. We're going to get the boilers too, but yeah, the whole thing is it. Um, here. And I, I almost, almost killed my sister. She bought us now an 80 year old house pulled the, the furnace, but she, like this, water heater venting into an exterior masonry chimney. This was again, 25 years ago when I was doing inspections, but man, I was a lousy inspector. And I'm a much better inspector now. And no matter how much, how much and how long you've been inspecting, you can always get better. But at that point, I mean, and her water heater was back drafting. She's going down her basement feeling sick. So, and I missed that doing her home inspection. Oh, bad, I, bad, 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 bad. Um, but again, it took a while before that. And that really, it wasn't like I was doing it. It wasn't really in the consciousness. But so much of this, I've, I've seen the profession come way way full year. Now, Hollis, I know would have caught that. Jim would have caught that 25, 30 years ago. But, you know, basically a, and when you have a masonry chimney interior or exterior that had been venting a furnace, they put the high efficiency furnace in and the furnace is no longer using that chimney to warm it up in wintertime. And the water heater is just like a candle trying to get that chimney to draft um, you know, the water heater's back drafting and you just, you fire the water heater up, particularly when the chimney's cold, hold your hand around the draft hood. If you feel hot gas is coming out or you see like little cinders around the exhaust, it's back drafting. Yank it, put an electric water heater in is the cheapest, simplest and cheapest. Lining the chimney is fine. Electric is greener these days than gas anyhow, but. Or put an electric water heater in. Yeah. Well, it should be. Yeah. 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 Um, and it's probably less money to just put an electric water heater in. And the electric water heaters now, I mean, they were expensive to run, but they've just beefed up the insulation 
on them tremendously. So I, I don't know what the economics of the electric water heaters are now, but uh, there's a lot of reasons to do so. With your plumbing fixtures, backflow and anti-siphon concerns, scald concerns, shower pans, clearances, sump pumps and water consumption pre-1993. So you're in this old house, it's got all the old original plumbing fixtures and your toilet's probably using seven gallons of flush because uh, that's what they did. Um, your faucets, well, well I, don't, I don't get it, but your showers used to be restricted to like what, two gallons a minute or a gallon and a half a minute. And now they have these rain shower things where they're running three quarter inch pipe to the shower controls and to the shower head. I, I don't get it, um, but is what it is. But, you know, your old toilets, your old faucets, the water's just flowing out and, and your sewer bills based on your water bill. So these are costing money. So you're just, you're, you're saving money by changing them out. The outlet of the faucet should be above the flood rim of the tub, any fixture actually. So if you fill the tub up and it goes above the faucet, but not overflowing the tub and there's a fire and they hook the fire engine up to the fire hydrant and start sucking the water out. The fire hydrant water is the domestic water in the neighborhood. You will suck your bath water back into the drinking water and contaminate it. Um, that happened in Roanoke. Termite guy had the hose in the tank and all your outside hose bibs, no backflow preventer should be in your report. Now they're making the frost free with the built-in backflow preventers that you can't tell if it's got it in there. If in doubt, call it out. Um, but in Roanoke, a termite guy had the hose in the tank, sucked the chemicals back into the neighborhood's water. It was plastic water mains. They dug up the entire street and had to replace the main. So that's why every outside faucet now, they want to see the uh, anti-siphons on them. Worst case scenario. Here, you know, faucet down the basement should have an anti-siphon on it. You know, again, you just like, huh, all this diddly stuff in my report, water contamination, somebody drinking it, getting sick. Here, none of these have any sort of uh, temperature compensation. The old houses galvanized pipe. Somebody flushes the toilet. Ha ha ha! We I could scald my brother or sister in the in the shower by flushing the toilet. Well, yes, you could. And today, that's that's a no no. Plumbing is very interesting and, and changing pretty rapidly that the 125 isn't sterilized and stuff. So they wanted 140 and tempering valves on every fixture. This stuff will come. Separate hot and cold, no discussions. Your shower pan with caulk at the base. Look under them if you can, and you do not have to do this, but you can just put a stopper in it and put two or three inches of water in it. If you get one of those fancy stoppers that's got a drain, you cannot worry about it. If you get just a rubber stopper that doesn't have a drain, don't forget you've got the damn shower running and the drain covered. Turn the water off when there's two or three inches of water there. And then have the realtor or somebody downstairs under the shower watching the ceiling or you just run down every few minutes and look at the ceiling. And odds are good, you won't see water. But if you see water, then you run upstairs and you pull the stopper out and let it drain as quickly as possible. But you found a leaky pan, which is X thousands of dollars to replace. And sometimes if you just run the water without doing that, they won't leak until you stand in them. So a couple inches of water and leave it sit for 15 or 20 minutes so it'll find its way through wherever it's going to and wind up on the ceiling. And again, I did some really expensive house somewhere in Loudoun County, giant bathroom, all that kind of stuff. And 
brand new house, but I'm doing the stopper in the giant shower. And the realtor and the buyers are down in the kitchen and the waters are running out of the friggin' recessed lights in the kitchen. Oops. You flooded the house. Well, I found the leak and they tore the whole friggin' giant tile shower out. New pan. Somebody put a nail through the pan or something. Something, but you know, this. So you will be the hero. You don't have to do that. Absolutely, you can disclaim it. When you say, when you, say you don't have to do it, I would suggest that you do a cost benefit analysis before deciding to go flood test the calculus. Man, that's a lot of thinking. The cost risk half balances. How, how yes. The, um, the Over the living room with oriental rugs and antiques everywhere. Well, but if you have somebody what down there the looking. Yes, I've had trash cans on kitchen counters. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I've had trash cans on kitchen counters catching the water because it drips for quite a while. Um, but yes. Yes, always a good idea, you know, before you do it, check and again, have somebody watching because if you're not watching and don't forget, you're filling a shower with a drain, you know, a stopper on the drain and there's all kinds of risk to you to do this. Anytime you perform a test, be prepared for it to fail the test. What yep, yes, yes, Abs uh, yes. Oh, excellent. I I'll steal that line. Do you uh, need, yes, do you uh, get all the water down in the new bill and let it all go? I tr would try to, yes. I've had superintendents come behind me pulling all the stoppers, yeah, yeah, pulling all the stoppers. And superintendent did that on one house, and son of a gun, the bar sink in the basement was clogged with a soda can in the drain line. And the superintendent didn't let me, he was running around. So they had to, I don't know, they snaked it and found the can and jackhammered the floor and replaced it and stuff. But yes, I, I would fill all the fixtures and that's, I let them all go and you're filling the sinks and don't forget you got the stopper in the sink. And some people say they don't leave the bathroom until all the fixtures, you're waiting 30 minutes for that stinking whirlpool tub to fill. It's nerve wracking. Well, you got to fill it to the overflow and you got to watch it and not have it go over the overflow when you get downstairs and don't get distracted talking to somebody or if you're working with a two man team, two person team, um, you know, have somebody watching it because I've. I've had it running down the face of the vanity and ruined the vanity. Somehow I didn't pay for that. Um, and again, you know, your showers overflow and and stuff like that but that's you know i've i've learned you, you you don't just start to fill it and leave it sit and then ignore it and go down half an hour later and look you either run there every five minutes again if you're not over a grand piano and a house full of antiques or have somebody sitting there oh yeah one of them realtor was sitting at the kitchen counter reading the newspaper and the water's dripping out of the ceiling on the counter next to him And it was going a while, and, you know, shower pan was bad and stuff, but. And, and too, my experience some of these is that if, if they know there's a problem with the shower pan, they're not using it for an extended period of time. And you can run the water there for a while, but it may take a while longer until all the materials under that tile get saturated to the point where it's going to, where it's going to flow. Yeah, but if you put some water in it and leave it sit for a little while, that's what it's. That you're giving the water time to find. Um, con yeah, conceivably. But and here you can see there's been a little bit of caulk down there, so maybe they had a little bit of water on the ceiling and thought caulk at the joints. Oh, house in new house where Woodstock or old house. Somebody's doing a bathroom, 
So I'm up there. He didn't, you know, had the tile in, but didn't grout the tile. So I'm up there, turn the shower on. I figure no grout, but you know, pans in there, everything's fine. The guy that was renovating the house comes up, run screaming at me, turn the water off, turn the water off. The shower's not ready. I don't have it grouted. Water was pouring out of the ceiling and down below. I don't have it grouted. You know, your pan's supposed to keep it dry. What's the shower pan? What's the shower pan? It was literally what he, what's the shower pan? Oh, well, okay. I think you have a bit more work to do in the shower, but, and it, it ain't my fault. I'm not paying for the stain on the ceiling. But yeah, your client moves in here. They take a shower and the ceiling falls out the next day. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. What's a shower pan? All righty. Home Depot, put the lock on the door. Don't let this guy in. Um, should have six feet, eight inches above front of a fixture, sinks, toilets, that one, not, not so much. And the toilets jammed in under the stairs where they added the powder room under the, the stairs, even in a nice house, you know, again, can't do anything about it, but just note it. Now here are sump pumps, battery backup. Good. Two sump pumps and one crock going to one drain out there. I mean, that's all okay. Check valve that all kind of looked all right. What's it tell you? Whole lot of water in that one. Whole lot of water in that one. Battery, ba uh, two sump pumps and the, you know, and the batteries. Yeah, yeah, two sump pumps and one crop. Probably a lot of water in that game. Oh, two and, okay. Yeah, yep, and you got a sump pump in this corner or some pump in that corner or some pump in that corner and, yeah. Oh, um, somebody was asking me, I forget who, but, oh, we were, we were talking, Stephen city, they put, they put their sump pumps down in the perimeter drain outside the foundation because the builders don't bring all that water into the basement. Stephen city, the soil is just dead clay. It doesn't drain for anything, but yeah, two sump pumps, a lot of water. This is not a sump pump. This is an ejector pump. This is sewage. So these are clean water. This is sewage. Another valve. And it, it might, it's probably above, above that in the picture. This was, this is the basement with coal with the pile of gravel coming in from the coal chute and stuff. This is back in the corner there. Oh yeah, some inspections you just you know, man, I'm a long time, but boy, I got a lot of stuff for my seminars. Um, yeah, there's the coal all about it, but you know, you have your waistline out, your ejector pump always should always have a vent. I said should always have a vent. Um, yeah, there's there's other valves probably on the pipes above that. And this is the toilet, the the sewer coming down in and into the side of the crock. The crock should be tightly sealed. It's, it's a check valve on the outlet. Yeah, so it doesn't go back, so you don't pump it out and it goes back, drain back down into the pit. Um, could be ground fault protected. They can put alarms on those too. Um, what else is that? Oh, but don't, you know, be careful to distinguish between, I mean, because people will come up to you and like, I got a, a, sump, a sump pump in the basement. No, you have an ejector pump in the basement. Well, what's the difference? And then ex explain to them. Also, they need to be vented to the atmosphere. You cannot put an air admit, well, you should not, should not put an air admittance valve on an ejector pump. They are that's prohibited by code. They need to be vented to the atmosphere one way or, or the other. You should not. And I have seen them. I thought that was a great idea until I looked in the code and said, nope. Nope. I don't. Uh, not not a bad idea if, if it fails. Um, if if the power's out. 
Uh, don't use the basement bathroom because your water comes in, but the sewage down there is, is not going out. Boy, I did one new house and I really, again, you, you think of, man, I was really stupid, but the whole house was draining into an ejector pump and it went up and out. And I told the lady, you have an ejector pump, but I didn't, didn't process for me to tell her you should be an alarm on it. So you don't have your crawl space filled with sewage. If the power's out, you, even though your water runs, uh, gas piping, gas piping for lights, your old flexible connectors that were brass. You have to look behind old fixtures. And if you see a flexible connector and it's not bright yellow, but it's brass, just scream. There's not, I don't think there's many left because they've either been replaced or they've failed and blown the houses up, but they just break. Old flexible gas connector that's old and brass can just fail completely, meaning the brass will just break and you have just gas spewing out. Uh, no shutoff valves or unions to connect and disconnect and service old gas valves, which may leak a hair, seismic support in areas that are affected by earthquakes. Uh, California, they tie their water heaters. They tie them, I mean, they strap them up tight. Oh yeah, we got a couple of them. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, well, I have a couple of slides for exactly, exactly that. Um, here, it's an old, again, Winchester, a lot of my inspection, inspections were Winchester, but basically they're bringing high pressure in, a reducer into the meter, but your main gas valve is, is in the building. That's no longer, no longer done. Um, your meter's pretty much always outside now, and the gas brought into the building is low pressure. It's Five to six PSI is high pressure, natural gas, low pressure is like a half a PSI. Um, not a great situation, but you know, your, your job is to show your clients where the main gas shut off. It's in the basement, isn't that unusual? Yes, your meters in the basement, isn't that unusual? Yes, and a sidewalk out front and stuff. Not for the period, no. But again, by current standards, it, it is unusual. Gas fixtures, if they have no safety features, no pilots, match lighting, the gas company will not service them. They just won't, won't touch them. These are your wall sconces. Somebody stuffed a candle in that, but I have inspected homes where the gas lighting piping was still connected. It was still active. You turn the gas light, fixture on and gas comes out. Oh yeah, really, really. Not often, but you know, get it disconnected. Yeah, yes, the post lights, they're horribly inefficient. They get banned and then they let them back in. But like, I think Alexandria's old town's full of them, full of them, old historic aesthetic. I mean, well, no, you'd have something hooked up to it, but <clears throat> good question. I, I think you probably did. It provided a better distribution of the light. I think that's the reason for the mantle, I believe, rather than just a flame. Yeah, I think so. But basically, you know, turn them off. You don't want gas lights in your house. Outside is uh, not a wonderful idea, but in the house, nope. And just, and you know, you're probably going to be hard pressed to turn that to see if it is still connected. But just evaluation by a specialist. Don't get in there and start leaning on the stick. No touchy valves. No touchy valves. Bad, bad, bad. Breaks off. Gas spewing out. Nah, it's iron pipe. 
Huh? Iron pipe. It's all iron pipe. Lasts forever. Yep. No, iron pipe. That's iron pipe poking out there. That's also knob and tube electric. This house was stripped, all the light fixtures. Combination gas and electric. Please blow house up. Gas was much more reliable than the electric around 1900. Combination and um, all the fixtures were gone, but you can still buy reproduction. Combination gas electric, but they're all electric. They don't, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Please blow house up. Down the basement on this house. And I'm looking at the galvanized pipe coming out, going into the wall. It's not water. It's a acetylene gas generator. You drop carbide rods in water and it produces acetylene gas, which was running through the house to those gas lights before somebody stripped them. Acetylene. I had seen this out in yards, out in the yards. There's a museum in Boyce or something like that. Big museum in, in the greenhouse. It's got a, the acetylene gas generator is, is still there. You'd, th you'd think at first it's a water cistern, but it's got a crown top. Why would you have a round top on a water vessel? You're not, it's not gonna, it's acetylene. So they would, wanted light, drop the carbide rod in the water would make acetylene gas, was pipe to the lights in the house. Um, you know, make a great bomb shelter or, or something, but again, a lid, you don't want anybody getting into it. And I, best of my knowledge, that gas pipe was still tied to the lights, but nobody was recently, you know, dropping carbide into the, uh, tank of water because it would be coming out where they stole the gas fixtures. Beautiful, beautiful house right on the water. Um, looking at the Navy Yard down in Hampton Roads. Oh, now we're getting into some electrical. So I forgot the roofing, but I put in tons of electrical for you, which I had almost no electrical in this because it would just got too long, but you gave me eight hours. I'm still running eight hours even without roofing. Safe inspection practices and tools for electrical. A voltage sniffer, absolutely miraculous invention from your point of view. A neon bulb tester. You can tell a lot more about an old receptacle with your little neon bulb tester than you can with your three light tester. They're easy to fool. Limited effectiveness, easy to fool. Ground fault tester. In Virginia, as a licensed inspector, you are required to test all ground faults with the button and the tester is really the best way to test them. You're only required to push the button, but Jim can explain to you the tester tests with a fault to ground, the button tests with a fault to neutral. So ideally testing your ground faults with the button and with your tester, you're testing two separate functions in that ground fault device. The new ground fault receptacles are actually now self-testing, so you don't have to test them, but as a home inspector, you're required. They self-test like every 15 minutes. And theoretically, if they're bad, they shut off because no one was pushing the button and, and testing. And the old ones, I mean, you test them and three out of four aren't working, but they're still providing power. Then they got them where when they weren't working, they would stop providing power and now they get them that they test themselves. So they're moving forward with, with that. But you want a ground fault tester, you're required to test everything that should be ground fault protected. Also check things before you touch them, is it hot? Optional, we're, we're getting to those. Well, well, yes, well, no. But let me get to that and I will elaborate on that. Um, optional testers, voltmeter, and I don't recommend any of this stuff unless you know exactly what you're doing with it. 
and are qualified to interpret the information that you are getting from these devices. Voltmeter, conceivably you can have 208 in a condo instead of 240. Clamp one ammeter, they're water heaters and stuff, but you gotta pull the wire out and get the ammeter on it. I ain't big on tugging on wires. I know some people like to tug all the wires and the breakers, Fernando. But he's an electrician and can put the wire back. I never, I never got that brave. Um, arc fault tester. Do not buy one. If you have one, take it out, apply a hammer to it rapidly. Toss it, remaining debris in the trash. Arc fault testers are made, but they're specific to the manufacturer. So if you're testing an arc fault and it's a arc fault manufactured by the AB company and you test it with an arc fault tester by the BC company, the arc fault tester can damage the arc fault. So you're not required to, put in, to test an arc fault tester with an arc fault tester. And in the ASHI report, oh man, I got my, I was severely corrected and rightly so by an electrical engineer who read my arc fault, ground fault article in the reporter. And that's why I came out with a two, half a page correction. Shoot, man, I was ignorant and teaching ignorance for years. And no home inspector caught me until I put it in a publication that went nationally. And man, whew, learn. Um, but I, he taught me quite a lot. It was very, the guy that really, one guy just reamed me, but didn't know squat. But another guy patiently worked me through it and explained absolutely everything. There's some people in, in Ashley that are incredibly knowledgeable and no personality whatsoever. <laughs> I don't know how they deal with their clients on a day-to-day -day basis, but um, but arc fault testers, you need to test an arc fault with a tester that was designed for that circuit by that manufacturer. So mix and match. So just just don't. Don't use a tester on the arc faults. Should you test the arc faults? If a house is empty, push the button and test them. And then ideally, though, it's getting really on. Well, Virginia's still bedrooms. All right, but it's going to change within a year or two. Like Maryland, West Virginia, like everything in the house is arc. Almost everything is arc fault protected. So what I would do would be if the house was empty, I would push the test button, see that it shut off and then go to the bedrooms and see that everything that should be arc fault protected was off. And now they've actually realized that a walk-in closet off the master bedroom is actually part of the bedroom. And now I'm seeing they weren't doing the, the freaking bedroom stuff on the arc faults. Now they're doing the bedrooms on the arc faults. Yeah. Well, but the bedroom walk-in closets, they weren't, they were doing the bedrooms, but not the walk-in closets. So I'm like, it's, you know, it's no, 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 it's a closet. All right. Um, and now the code requires, Virginia does not, arc faults on almost everything. Um, if a house is empty, push the buttons. And in Virginia, you can run around to the bedrooms and see that everything is off in the bedrooms. And it almost always is. And this is new construction. Um, if a house is occupied, do not test the arc faults because you, are, you do not know what you are turning off. Life support somebody's computer, not on a UPS. Um, so you're required to note the presence or absence. Ground faults, you're required to test. Arc faults, you're required to note if they have them or don't have them. And you're inspecting a lot of old homes and they don't have them. Well, I was noting the presence, making it a minor concern, but arc faults, particularly in old houses, are, are, are good stuff. So I made them a, a bold print recommendation because they're rel they're not cheap, but two or three hundred dollars in a service call by an electrician. So he got five or six hundred bucks to get the panel in the old house filled with arc fault breakers on all the old circuits. 
a legitimate use of arc fault breakers is to protect older wiring. That's in the manufacturer's description of, of approved uses. So you can load the house up with arc fault breakers. Might cost a bit of money, but your odds of the house not burning down just went up tremendously. The ideal thing is replace all the electrical in the house. Who's gonna to wanna to hear you tell, you tell them that? Well, it's all old rag wire, just tear it all out. Replace it, no problem. I had a client buy a house, beautiful house, plaster walls, masonry construction. She had her electrician go and start to replace all the receptacles in the house and all the insulation. He started touching these old things and the insulation just started just breaking all off the wires. And owner called me up, Mr. Perry, Perry Construction. You go out into Winchester, you see who's doing all the road projects and built the FBI building and all kinds of stuff. Perry Construction, Mr. Perry called me up, my client. Dave, they're trying to do this. Okay, let's go to the report. Ah, older wiring, possible deterior insulation. Oh, there it is, Dave. Thank you very much. I said, tell the, your wife, leave the freaking old receptacles. Add new receptacles where you need them. Leave the old ones. Don't touch it unless you're prepared to rewire them. And put arc faults in. An arc fault recommendation, arc fault. Old house wiring is, you know, again, was in, has been a standard item in all my reports in bold print because the possible consequence is fire. Ground faults protect people from shock. Arc faults limit the risk of a, an electrical fire in a house. So they are just about, they are as important and serving a completely different function than the ground faults, but both are very good and arc fault protecting. And then if somebody replaces, well, what if the arc fault keeps tripping? Well, if the arc fault keeps tripping, well, first change the arc fault. And if the second arc fault starts tripping, you have a problem and it's gonna be, it may well be a devil of a problem to find, but your house isn't burning down. So there is a plus to this and you've caught and fixed the problem before your house caught fire. And so my clients don't even have to use the ones that makes the difference working. Yep. How they go in there, you can test it, but you said you need to, or you need to you test the reset when you come out, or you need to test the reset when flying across the room. <laughs> yeah. said, it's not because you tested it, it's because you tested it, now we're not going to die. Yep. <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and the ones that um, you trip them and they won't reset because they're bad and they want you to pay for it. My kitchen receptacles were working. No, no. Here, let's go. I am required to test it. It did not reset because it is defective. I did not break it. I did my job. I found a problem. You need to pay an electrician to replace the ground fault. You know, it's just it, it, you did your job, you found the problem, the owner needs to fix the problem, it's inconvenient, but it's not on you. It is not on you and you can, you know, they can scream all they want and you did your job, you did the right thing. Um, sophisticated electrical testing devices will tell you all kinds of stuff. I don't own one, I wouldn't, I don't think I would know. I'm pretty, you know, the impedance in the wiring and stuff, man, I wouldn't know what the heck. I was, I was, you know, trying to determine with these things, electrical engineers, they can do that stuff. That's what, you know, it's what they do. But you're a home inspector, stay away from that stuff. You know, do what you need to do, do it well. Sometimes there are advantages to go above and beyond. I think now Virginia says test every receptacle, accessible receptacle finally. Used to say test test a receptacle so one a room is good enough now in virginia if you don't know it one a room is not good enough you need to test everything you can get to the garage ceiling is not accessible 
don't need to drag a ladder into the garage to test those, but you need to test every, you should be testing every receptacle you can get to. One a room is not Virginia's, is no longer Virginia's standards. Were, were you or weren't you using an ammeter to test water here, electric water? Here? Never. Really? Never. Pull the wires out, run an amp meter around it. Now, I mean, I can, but no, so I've never done it. You can have a thermostat or an element that's out that yep. you won't know until the second one goes out. Yep. Or you'll know when it's <laughs> well, if you're you know running the hot water and you're halfway through the inspection, all of a sudden you got no more hot water, you might you might find it, but um, put an amp meter. Well, no, never done it. Ne if I was still doing, I would not plan to do it. You're you're pulling wires out. You're taking things apart. You need to get clearance on that wire to get the clamp on around it and stuff. It is well beyond the scope. If you're comfortable as if you're comfortable doing that, great. You can you know you're going above and beyond and potentially finding uh, a problem. That would cost somebody 150 bucks to fix. So nobody's dying for cold water instead of hot. But pulling wires out with 240 volts and the wire pops off the screw and hits the case of the water heater and goes zap and well, you find a water heater breaker, hope it is the water heater breaker pull the wire out of the panel to get the clamp on. Hope it doesn't hop out of the breaker. And then also hope that you understand the staging in the water. Heater. Yeah. Because if you don't know what you're staging, you don't know what you need. If the panel's three rooms down, it's not going back. You know, it is possible, but it's well above the beyond the scope where you're nobody's dying it, it's not a thousand dollar fix unless you call michael the plumber then it's a fourteen hundred dollars yeah. yeah. fix but the water heater is probably old and, and yeah where you have hard water they're just going all the time you you could do that but there are some things where you're opening you know you'll be all right until you're not and what's the knot? It's, it's You'll easy. find out. It's easy if it's better to find a plug. The water heater is fine from the mug. You are going to need to find some electric water heater. You are going to find at some point the water's not. Why it is hard as it used to be, and it doesn't last nearly as long as it used to last. One of your elements is gone, pull the plumber, it's time to replace the water heater. Yep. For, for that. And I use. Uh, you, like eight to ten life expectancy on water heaters, they usually go longer. Five minutes until break. Okay. Can you disclaim uh, electric backup for uh, heat pumps then? The emergency backup needs to be. Oh, yeah. Just disclaim it. So sure. Well, I turn into emergency heat, crank her up, hot air coming out. Good enough. Yeah. Are they all working? No idea. Pull the cover off, put the ammeter on all them buggers. Mm -mm, mm -mm. But no, I would put the switch to emergency heat, crank it up, and I want to feel smelly, you know, smell the heat, feel the hot air coming out, and okay, you got emergency backup. And if you don't, there's there's an issue. So I, I do that, but I don't, again, put an ammeter, a uh, clamp on ammeter on all those elements. That's, um, oh, gr electrical grandfathering. You got a low porch rail, you got gorgeous handrail, guardrail, doesn't meet current standards. Tear it out, replace it. Nope, you have an issue, you know, something that is historic fabric, be careful, doesn't meet code. Electrical, no. There is no grandfathering in electrical. And in Virginia, you can have a 1954 house 
with a receptacle on the light fixture above the bathroom, doesn't need to be ground fault protected. If you have a receptacle above the sink, the house not, not, was built without ground fault. Virginia in its wisdom says your granddaddy didn't need it. You don't have to put a ground fault back. You're absolutely friggin' stupid to not put a ground fault back. Doesn't have a ground wire, don't care. Ground fault works fine without a ground wire. Needs a black and a white. It's just insane. So grandfathering with electrical is fire and shock, you know, fire and shock. I don't care. And the realtors for the arc faults and stuff, they'll be screaming at you. Ah, oh, man, they don't need this. It's going to cost them. You're scaring somebody to death. Um, I don't care. Tough. This is, you know, this is a potential hazard. Life safety. House burned down. Bad day. Real bad day. When you have the agent kids start talking about this is what your grandfather did. My standard statement is grandpa's dead. You didn't upgrade the safety statement. Super. Grandpa's dead. Grandpa's dead. So, that was specifically another issue. I am going to hit some of that stuff, but go ahead with your question. We'll, we will get to that. We will get to that. Um, break time, is it? Oh, well, let's, um, grandfathering, I'll say you can't say it's against code, but everything electrical is safety. You know, you can just scream bloody murder about everything electrical because it's all safety. You know, and end of statement. I, I think there might be, oh, Grounds and neutrals. Oh, more than one neutral wire under a screw. That's one of the few electrical issues that I don't make as a problem item. I, when an electrician comes in and is doing something else on the house, he can put one neutral wire under each screw. That's an equipment protection concern. And about the only thing I can think of that's equipment protection. Everything else with electrical is fire and shock. Do it. Well, how quickly, I'll show you some please, I've got some please kill me here. Um, let's, let's take the break. This is a, a little, a good break point. I'll start in services and I'll be 10 yeah. minutes. Super. Hey, welcome back. We're gonna get started. I think it has been through all my conversations. Still, still green, yep. Okay. Yep. So, I'm interrupt one more time. Anybody who's uh, at the Civil War bus talk to me after the meeting's up. If you're interested in Civil War stuff, come talk to me after the meeting's up. I have an interesting thing to share. Well, I won't take it. Here we go. I've been talking to everybody for 10 minutes of the break. Yeah, okay, good. Because I just didn't see anything on there. So. All righty, we're going to get into old house electrical. The service, uh, if it's house is over 60 years old, almost universally, it's an overhead service. You're looking, your concerns with the capacity and potential water heater metering. Here, this is an overhead service. I have the, I have a pointer in my clicker, but it just it doesn't do what the green laser does. And they had the house sided. So you can see the service entrance cable disappear behind the soffit, and come out at the meter. Um, the service entrance cable, not must be exposed, but should be exposed because it can be concealed damage and uh, somebody, you know, the cable TV company wants to, hang a, an attachment so they can bring their wire in and run it right through the service entrance cable. So that's, that's bad. Anything within six inches of a floor should be protected. Here the deck was added. You can see the second meter. There's a second meter there. 
the homes were not apartments. There wasn't a separate meter for a separate occupancy in the home. They used to meter the electricity for electric water heaters at a different rate, at I believe a lower rate than the rest of the electric for the house because they were trying to sell electricity. And so they've blanked the second meter off. Doesn't mean it's disconnected, it means it's blanked off. There's no meter there. There's no power in that wire. We will get to that. But your second meter on the single family homes is, you know, an abandoned covered second meter is a water, an old water heater. Your types of service, you'll have a main disconnect, you'll have a single bus panel, a split bus panel, the number of main disconnects, you can have up to six hand movements to turn a service off in a building, whether that's a high rise, apartment building, condo building, if it's a house, six hand movements maximum. So. No, the main disconnect is not where a fireman can get to it. Main disconnect is somewhere where the building maintenance personnel can get to it. It's in, it's in a meter room or a remote location where you have full-time maintenance people. It's not for fire, but the maintenance people have access to the main. So if you need the main shut off, you call. They can't cut their whole panel off, but their individual breakers are in their unit that they can shut each individual circuit off. So they have control over the distribution in their unit they don't have a main but the main is accessible to the maintenance personnel so to be clear the sixth row pool is on the main pan or the main disconnect area so it's like so, so if you have area you area a disconnect, right on the, on the condo you got all the condos are sub pan so that six row pool yes that's correct. The main disconnect is in a remote location, which you may or may not be able to actually access. But in, in the condos, it's the building personnel, the maintenance crew that have access to that. And even if there's like there's 20 condos and they each have a main, well, you got more than six disconnects for the building. But ahead of all those 20 disconnects and their individual meters, is a 1200 amp main disconnect and a meter outside for the electric company to, you know, or individual metering for the units, but there is a main disconnect or six or less disconnects. You'll, you'll often see this alone in DC and in condo, uh, smaller individual condo units. You see a panel with a number of like three or four or six Meters, three or four or six, this to the external to the Yep. And that's where you don't have your maintenance personnel. So these are accessible to the occupants. Yep. And somebody else can turn your main disconnect off, and we'll get to that too. We'll get to that too. We'll, we'll get to that too. Since I can't do a little soft, we can just repeat. What you what you were talking about for in one of those four four plexus types of things. Um, if you have an apartment building and there's no or you know a small condo building, there is no building superintendent on site, then the main disconnect needs to be accessible to the occupants of the building. So on the front of these homes that have been converted to like four condo units, DC is full of them. Um on the front of the building or back of the building, you'll see electric coming in and you'll have two, three, four main breakers and two, three, four basically gang 
meter boxes with main breakers. And then all these in all the interior panels are all sub panels now. You know, the condo that had full 120 volt, that was a sub panel. You should have grounds and neutrals separated in that. The main disconnect is wherever the heck the main is. Anything after the main disconnect is a sub panel. Even if your main disconnect is here and it's bolted to a panel full of breakers here, this is your main panel. This is a sub panel. And I've been in arguments with people about that too. Um, this is an exterior service. Again, this is my house. I don't know how I got a black and white photo out of the deal. Not a lot of sunlight that day or something, but basically that cover hinges up. I got a main breaker at the top, goes down and all these wires go within six of you know, the ground and running around the house and into the attic and all, all kinds of stuff. But uh, again, retrofitting some of this stuff doesn't come out neat or clean. And a lot of these old houses, you see the main panels right on the front porch. It's just, you know, what you do, but it's better than not having electricity. Now, how many mains are here? How many main, wells? main breakers. How many main breakers are in this? I saw, is that a one, Don? Keep going up. Four. I, I heard the right answer. Three. Fernando. One, two, three. Well, he knows the answer. I, might, might, might as well. That's right. The person who should know the answer did know the answer. So the wire feeding the smaller box is not coming from the, the, the water meter. Gotcha. Remember that? Yeah. Blanked off water meter. Oh, that wire going down is abandoned. No, it's not. Yeah. It's running down. That's the wire going from the water heater meter is coming down into that box. And it used to be a 240 volt breaker with a handle tie. And now it's serving 220 volt circuits. But I was looking and like, okay, I have no wire coming out of the panel going into this panel, but I have one wire coming in and you know pulled the cover off and saw what was going on and figured out they're feeding that from, but you're required to you know, tell your clients and in your report how to turn all the power in the building off. And on this one, it's three mains and they should be clearly labeled as main disconnects and, and here they are, they are not, not take a magic marker and scroll main, but because there's no handle ties, uh, both those breakers have to be turned off in that panel. Hey, isn't that meter cool? The meter is not there, it's been jumpered. Jump, so it's here. It's in, in this one, it's now running through the one meter going, it used to be ahead, it used to be ahead of it, but when it's rewired, it's now behind it. If you, because they no longer meter the water heater electric rate, the, the water heater electricity at a different rate. The only reason they did that was you was cheaper to run your electric water heater. They were trying to sell electric water heaters. Sure, you could. Somebody chose not, not to do that. Somebody chose not to do that, but your job is to figure it out and and ex and explain it. Well, yeah, yank yank the meter that's there and get in there and fool with those connections while it's connected at the street and it's all live. And uh, sure, you could. That was the power company. Pa the meter box, the meter is there. Typically there. I, I, yeah, oh, people do all kinds of stuff, but yeah, all kinds of stuff. But basically in, in this particular scenario, by looking carefully and figuring out and going out and coming back and said, okay, nope, you know, there's three mains there. So again, your job is to look at that, figure it out, note it in your report and explain it to your clients. Because if somebody turned that breaker off thinking the whole house is dead, Two circuits, 220 volt circuits are not dead. 
All right, Federal Pacific, replace. Very simple. Anytime you see Federal Pacific, replace. There's no, people will argue and Woodbridge is full of them. We're just looking fine. Federal Pacific, replace. Simple. This is a split bus panel. It happens to be Federal Pacific. That was actually a sub panel. But basically, if you look, I probably just ran my, no, I don't know. Um, batteries may be going. It's a damn USB charger. Ah, backup is, there we go. That's why I was using the green one. You can see it a lot better. To turn the whole house off, you have six main breakers. And one of these breakers feeds the lower bus. This is a split bus. The service comes in, runs the connections. There's the top bus, six main breakers. One of those breakers feeds the lower breakers. Again, Federal Pacific replaced, but this is a, a split bus panel. I was back and forth with Reggie Marston for probably 15 years. Who I think had the good sense to retire. He said, you, I'd say six, main, six breakers in the top, 120 volt, no problem. He finally showed me or convinced me why that was incorrect. There is no main breaker ahead of those top breakers. So if you have 240 volt circuits in it, you've got like a 20 amp breaker, 40 amp breaker. But if you have receptacles on that, 120 volts. Ooh, gentleman and a scholar. This, pick that one there. Cool beans. Yeah, the green juice shows up much better. Thank you. Um, if you have a receptacle circuit in there, 120 volt, 15 or 20 amp, and for some reason there's a short and the breaker is defective, you have that circuit capable of carrying the full capacity of the service, 150 or 200 amps. So whatever the short is, will just fry until something either the metal just burns away or starts a fire. So if you see a split bus panel, upgrade is recommended. And there should be no single pole breakers in the primary bus. But these are all these are all dated. This is the inside of this. Again, there's just like huge issues, water following the conduit in, running down, rusting the daylights out of it. This is the split bus breaker. And you can see the wires coming out of that breaker. They actually come down and run alongside the top bus bar and make a connection to the lower bus bar. So these are the feeds. They're outmoded. Uh, you don't have to replace them, but they're 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 dated. We're we're gonna get to it, Jim. We're gonna get to it. Oh, you can have. Well, you can have a two bus split bus panel. You can have a three bus split bus panel where two of the six breakers at the top will feed a middle bus and a lower bus. There's fewer and fewer of these out there, but some of them, so you can have a two bus separate buses. You can have a triple bus. So what is the um, says that there's listed retrofit kits for the Federal Pacific Low Center. A little less expensive than replacement. Any opinion on those? Marginally, if any, less expensive than just replacing it and putting a decent panel in. Good morning. Okay. Yeah. A lot of times, the problem is the enclosure is too Oh, yes. Oh, in the, well, we, we can do. I knew I wasn't going to run out of what wasn't going to run out of material once I started jamming electrical and even though I skipped roofing electrical electrical well and and this is oh yeah electrical is always always plenty of discussion um plus a new panel will give you an opportunity to install the park yes which you're not going to put in an old panel um in early 2000s maybe the wire bending the wire space requirements was increased maybe late 
1990s, 2000, some, any, any dates on that, Fernando? Some, but used to have like the little teeny 200 amp panels and now they're all this big. Yeah, yep, the, 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 um, the volume of the panel, you need to have a certain amount of volume in the panel for the number of conductors. That was increased dramatically. So that's when all the 200 amp panels became this long. And also used to be 40 circuits was the maximum, 42 circuits, two are the main in a 200 amp panel. Now you can have 60, you get into some of these condos or something and these panels are just giant, giant, giant. But I'm, I wanna focus on older electrical, but uh, you, all kinds of stuff. House running around, there was a sub panel in the cellar of this old house, gorgeous historic old house. And I'm like, but I, I see no main, where the heck is it? No meter on the outside, no nothing. I beat the dickens out of me, it was a long time ago. I wander out in the yard. I mean, I was a ways out in the yard. Son of a gun, there I was. They didn't want the meter sticking on the outside of the house. So the service came in to the meter, through the meter, giant exterior disconnect. All this is all fine, but every, I mean, again, you're just, I mean, I was wandering around, I was round and around and around the outside house. Come on, where's the friggin' I know the panel's here. Where's the service? In the yard. Oh, this was 75 feet away in the woods. So it wasn't like obvious, but completely legitimate. Didn't want to see the meter on the outside of this lovely old stone house. Local convention. Well, I've seen, well, like um, trailers, manufactured housing, it's out at the meter. Inside is a sub panel. Houses, I've seen new houses built front row on the river floodplain on the Shenandoah floodplain where, you know, the meter and disconnect are out in the yard, way the heck away from the house. Still seems to me it might flood, but um, I had not seen that in West Virginia, but any, anything is possible. Lo if the local inspector wants it, the, you know, the tradesperson can fight and go to court and appeal and waste all kinds of time or just say, yes, sir, I'll be happy to change this and I'll do it that way at every job in the future in your jurisdiction. You know, you just, you pick your battles. Bootleg connections, a bootleg ground where you connect a neutral to a ground. So when you put your old house, you get down to the panel box and it's got all the old armored cable and two conductor wiring coming out and you go to all these new three slot receptacles and they're all grounded. Dang, isn't that nice? No, it's little wire between the neutral terminal and the ground and it fools your three light tester. You can detect that with a sophisticated tester, but if you see a whole bunch of two conductor wire leaving the panel and the whole house is filled with, you know, and you can pull the receptacle cover off and, you know, probably see that also, but if it's two conductors coming out of the panel and all apparently grounded new receptacles in the house, you've got a flipper and, you know, they just jump the neutral on the ground. There's multiple ways of finding this sort of stuff. Um, it's hazardous. It does not provide a separate pathway for the grounding electrode conductor. It may leave equipment energized, meaning voltage on the cabinet of a metal toaster, something like that. Bootleg neutrals. We're using the grounding conductor to carry current, usually to run a 120 volt device from a 240 volt circuit. Hazardous because the grounding conductor is now carrying current, a potential shock hazard. Now we're back to that light in the well pit. The well circuit is 240 volts and you've got 120 volt light. Sometimes you'll have a panel box, but they generally brought 240 volts into the well pit and they're, they're bootlegging that. Um, so there's, that's a, a reasonably common example when you're in, inspecting houses, older houses with wells in pits. Bonding, 
Bonding shall be provided where necessary to ensure electrical continuity and the capacity to conduct safely any fault current to be imposed. You'd have to think about that to really understand it, but it boils down to tie everything together electrically. All the metal parts that are supposed to be zero voltage with respect to ground, such that if anything gets inadvertently energized by the ungrounded conductor, the whole shooting match doesn't have 120 volts on it until somebody walks over to it and touches it standing on the damp floor. Um, so it's a, it's a simple concept. You just make sure everything is bonding of services, all, all metal parts, the metal water pipe, other metal piping, equipment grounding conductor for the circuit capable of energizing the piping shall be permitted to serve as the bonding means. Basically, if you have a gas hot forced air furnace with 120 volt circuit to it, the grounding run to power the furnace that's connected to the cabinet of the service bonds the gas pipe. That's okay, except for corrugated stainless steel tubing. Corrugated stainless steel tubing, the bonding shall be at the point of entrance. We're not gonna get into that because that's the electrical session, but uh, basically you wanna make sure that all your metal parts, your duct work, everything is all connected together and to the electrical system. So there's no voltage difference, no shock hazard. James. If it is connected directly to the cabinet of the furnace by the 120 volts, but if there's, if it has flex connectors, then there should be jumpers across them but there never is. And I'm, yeah, yeah. Oh, and in Leesburg, corrugated stainless steel, the, the mechanical inspector in Leesburg will not allow the gas pipe to be bonded. Doesn't want any connection between the gas pipe and, and the electrical. So in Loudoun County, um, you electricians can't bond the corrugated stainless steel gas piping. Um, no, it's him. It's it's one inspector, but he's he's got in Loudoun County for gas. Oh yeah, I've been you know I've had a discussion with um, Buell, Mr. Buell, Buell Electric does you know runs huge shop. I was like, no bond. County inspector won't let me do it. You know, call me on the phone. Very nice. I can't do it. County inspector won't let me. Code says bond. You read code bond. CSST bond. Nope, not in Loudoun County. And the way the code's written, the inspector is God. Argue with that guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um. Uh, at this point, it's probably been three or four years. Yeah. Yeah, it's just one guy. It's it's one guy. And the way the code is written, I guess the inspector can overrule the governor. I mean, that's the way the code is written. The the inspector is God. His his whatever he says, no matter what the code says, and I'm like, the code says, nope. Electric, the county inspector, county gas inspector will not allow the gas pipes to be bonded, even though it's bonded at the furnace. But in this case, it's not the code making the statement, it's the general statute. No. No, the code. This is, and the code, he didn't change the code. It is his personal opinion that you do not, you cannot, you should not bond the gas pipes because he doesn't want any connection between the gas and the electrical. Disregarding that every gas furnace that he's ever looked at has got electric running to it. You know, but and I don't know if he's still, you know, I don't know what the current situation, but this wasn't that long ago. 
you know, and, and I had an argument. I, I was talking to Tim Buell, said, sorry, I, I just can't do it. And he nicely explained to me why. Okay, it's still in my report. The code says it. I have to put it in. And he says, I know, but I'm not going to do it. Okie doke. All those words. Could you allow it to be an independent ground? Your water, your your furnace is grounded. I, mean, I know, but I mean, your 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 gas water, your power vented water heaters, are grounded. So I don't I don't know the specifics of it, but it just the authority having jurisdiction decided that this was what he wanted. It was a man, and the contractor who wires hundreds of houses in his district said i gotta do what the guy wants okie doke didn't change my report and just the client wasn't going to ask him to do that should it be bonded that's what the code says so i'd kind of do it big or small you know it's doesn't make any difference there's your bonding wire to the water service coming in knuckle style clamp on a ground rod I have seen occasionally a couple times where you had your old galvanized water service and it was replaced with a plastic service. New service and your bonding wires running out of the panel box to the old galvanized pipe going out the foundation. Theoretically, if it goes 10 feet out from the foundation, it can serve as a ground, but how does anybody know how far that goes out? So just run a bonding wire to the water pipe now because your service is no longer the bond and is there a ground rod or two ground rods because it's the whole electrical service now has no real bonding other than by default. The object is that all these, all zero resistant paths, if there's any fault current, you want just z multiple zero resistance paths because if there's a high resistance and a low resistance, most of the current goes through the low resistance. And if you become the low, you know, a person becomes the low resistance in a fault situation, then that's that's a shock. That's the definition of a shock. To a ground rod, six gauge, no matter how large the service is, six gauge to the ground rod. Don't know why. Um, there is a reason, but not, but it, there are six gauge. Um, here again, again, it's, it's, you know, this is a new panel box. It's an old house, but electrical is electrical. Your grounding electro, uh, electrode conductor goes to a grounding electrode in a main panel only. Your bonding jumper connects to the ground and the neutral. So in the main panel only, the grounds and neutrals are connected. Everything after the main panel, if the main panel is one disconnect outside in the yard, inside, it's a sub panel and your grounds and neutrals should be separated. And that was in the 60s. So you get in a lot of older houses there. You don't have that situation. If your main panel is here, the distribution panel is here connected by a conduit. That's a main panel. That's a sub panel. Again, in, in my opinion, but I take a, a strict interpretation. If the main disconnect is in this panel, this is a sub panel. And anything downstream from it is a sub panel. Once you get to a sub panel, they're all sub panels. So if you have another panel after your sub panel, that's another, it's a sub panel fed from, but main, you have one main panel and then a sub panel. Objectionable currents. This is from Jim and actually Mike Holt. Basically, that deals with like the bootleg neutrals, the bootleg ground. You have currents that are running through wires that should not have currents. So that's a problem. So apparently Mike Holt likes to call them objectionable. You're objecting to those things. They're, they're wrong. You can call them a lot of things, but basically you're creating multiple paths for current to go. And again, you can have 
things be energized that should not be energized. And when someone touches them, they can become the low resistance path for the electrical current. And at six milliamps through your heart, get your heart doing all kinds of bad things. Well, no, you can't see it. You're looking for your bootlegs. You're looking for your separate, well, your separation of your grounds and neutrals in your, it all boils down to all the things that I've been covering to this point. But what those, what the reason these are all problems and significant problems, potentially significant problems is because again, you can read all that. And, but basically you've got current running through stuff that shouldn't be carrying current and Therefore, if something is disconnected, you now have all the four wire feeds to the dryers. It used to be your ground would carry the current for the timer, but when somebody was taking the dryer apart and disconnected that, you and you know, you held the dryer and you grounded yourself, you were carrying the current it was running through the timer. It only takes six thousandths of an amps across your heart. So now you've got the separate grounds, the four conductor, separate grounds and neutrals. Again, the only place they're connected is the main panel. Yep, um, well not the main panel, whether it's distribution, you know, the main panel, then again, there's distribution panels. So, um, and that really was, I think 93, Three or 96 code when they when that was changed that's been a change within my time as an electrician and, and a home inspector um yeah no no if that it is grandfathered in the code the odds of a shock are you know primarily to a service person you know taking stuff apart so if you don't have the four wire connection to your dryer, then you should have a separate grounding connection from the casing to a ground source. No, because it is grand, that's grandfathered. Yeah. But again, the odds of a shock to a person, the, the cabinet is still grounded, but the ground is carrying the current from the timer. So if you disconnect the ground wire and the timer is on, the timer's trying to use 120 volts, so trying to get some current through the ground wire. So again, the, the primary source of hazard for that is someone servicing the equipment, which is why the code doesn't require you to, when you change by a dryer, you they still make, you know, like three wire dryer cables and four wire dryer cables. So you have to look and see, do you have a three or a four? The code doesn't make you change that. When you change your dryer, do you have to upgrade the electrical to it? No. One of a few things grandfathered and the likelihood of a shock to the personnel, the people using the dryer is, is small. Um, objectionable currents, lots of words. The two critical words, fire, shock. And this is just, you know, specific the the technical aspect of fire bad shock bad yeah fire bad shock bad life expectancy of panel boards this is what you were looking at jim basically manufacturer's recommendation but 40 years is typical see a lot of my panel, I'm pretty sure, is older than 40 years at this point, getting close to it. Um, older panel boards, the ability to obtain breakers, the life expectancy of the components. Fuses have unlimited life expectancy, but they have disadvantages. Subpanels, separation of grounds and neutrals. You need a disconnect for the feed to the subpanel where the feed originates. A disconnect at the sub panel is actually optional. You can turn the power at the sub panel and work on it, but you need to be able to turn the feed to the sub panel off at whatever you know upstream panel that the sub panel is being fed from. Old house, ah, this stuff is all dead. 
all been abandoned. Biz light, biz light, biz light, biz light, biz light. I beg to differ. I beg to differ. Um, people don't tell you things because they're lying. They tell you things. They could be lying, but they're most likely mistaken. But your job is not verify. Your job is to just get in there and test it for yourself. All oh, this is abandoned. It's not, you know, been disconnected for years. And my little, little neon tester singing out on everything. Um, what the heck what I was doing, I have no idea, but pretty sure needs replacing. Funky. All right. Whoops. Um, there's actually two disconnects in these panels. The one fuse block disconnects all this other stuff and this, but the other fuse block goes to the range. So there's actually two disconnects to turn that whole house off. You have to pull both of those top blocks out. Fuses, theoretically, I've heard an argument that fuses always work, breakers may fail, but a 240 volt appliance protected by a fuse, one side blows, the other side's still hot. The service, com service person comes to service the dryer. There's still 120 volts on the dryer. Also, it's really easy to take the 15 amp fuse or 20 amp fuse that's feeding the kitchen out and screw the green 30 amp fuse in and set the house on fire. My granddad used pennies. My granddad used pennies. They don't burn out. Yes, sir. Yes. They should, yes. But it's not a common trick. If one trips on overturn, that doesn't necessarily trick the other one. If it shuts both handles off, it it will. It's supposed to. It it will. Yeah. Yeah, it, it should pull them both off. Yeah. yeah. Well, even even the the ones that tie the handles together, if it if one trips, it should pull the other one over. How effective they are, you know, is certainly questionable. But it should definitely, and that's the object is that you know all the power, all the on grounded voltage to that appliance is off. So the whole, you know, somebody goes and starts tearing into it. There's, there's no 120 volts scrolling around. Fernando. The common trick is actually an internal function to the breaker. The handle is there to operate it. Oh, okay. And put a handle on it. One of them trips. The other one doesn't automatically trip, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's the use of proper from the same manufacturer for that purpose. Good, should triple them both. And it's probably 40 years old, so upgrade recommended. But the, this kind of stuff, you know, just okay, it might work, but you know, it's it's grossly outdated by current standards. You can't upgrade it. You can't add circuits. So you're going to have to do something. Here, Federal Pacific panel, again, replaced, but a 100 amp main to a sub panel. You can see the wires just pushing that breaker right off there. Federal Pacific replace. Fuse panel boards. You can have a main fuse only, two fuses and a single pullout with breakers for feeders and branch circuits. We did see the one Federal Pacific panel, the main, for whatever reason, they stuck the main breaker outside the cover. Oh, Federal Pacific panel, you're going to recommend replace. You can just decline to pull the cover off. If you've got that main breaker sticking out, the odds that you can get that cover off without tripping that main, they trip at a sneeze. I've done that. People running out yelling at me. Breakers fall out. You know, Federal Pacific replace. 
I would I would still pull the covers just to see how bad the stuff was inside it. But Federal Pacific Replace, it is, you know, really not any you're not doing any disservice by not pulling the cover off. It's it's bad for mm -hmm. more reasons than I have time to explain to you, Mr. and Mrs. and Ms. Uh, the Internet's scary enough. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look it up. Look it up on the internet. Just replace. Um, you can have main end branch circuits fuses. The fuses, again, obsolete, won't shut off all the ungrounded conductors of a multi wire. Use extreme care, just, just decline. Fuse neutrals, very dangerous, hazardous. You're, the fuse in the neutral can blow, and you still have 120 volts running around on the appliance. Um, enough steel on that for a tank replace you know in a bathroom yes the wallpaper is going to get chopped up here main breaker all kinds of fuses little circuit breakers that replace screwed 30 amp fuses in to replace 15 and 20 screamer day one pull the 30s out look at the size of the wire put in 15 or 20 amp fuses back and your house won't burn down until you have an opportunity to replace the whole shoot and match. Um, again, two disconnects, two fuse blocks. And this was, yeah, this is your main breaker sticking out of the cover, breakers and fuses and federal replace, replace. And actually this was a wall. So that is about, I don't know, eight inches between the front of the panel. Obsolete panel boards, Zinsco. These are antique, replace, Wadsworth, uh, Murray, Square D, Pushmatic, or Bulldog. A lot of these were, some of these were quality products, but they're all old, can't get parts. That's a Wadsworth panel box. Just recommend upgrade. Just those breakers, double, triple, quadruple, taps. Um, you can't, well, they, can't get any breakers so let's just keep jamming the wires for the new circuits in the old breakers no 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 i know this is for older homes but just as a reminder everybody in case you had this new Schneider electric which makes the square new panels 2019 to 2022 complete recall Yes, one one point four million panels Holy Toledo. I'm thinking now nah, the new work I did, I didn't put any square D panels in my house and my barn, so we're good. We're good. Um fuse neutrals where you've got fuses on the neutrals, shock hazard upgrade. This is just a please kill me. Wet seller. New 200 amp service brought to the house. They backfed this shit. Excuse me. Um, stand on a wet cellar floor. Touch any of that stuff. You're dead. This is please kill me stuff. And that an electrician would go in and upgrade a service and look at this. But I mean, maybe he argued and, and the owner just said no. But this is please kill me stuff. Um, this is immediate. And this, I mean, the ceiling was like 6'2", six, 6'4". Six, you just touch it and you're on a damp concrete floor. Um, replace. A lot of this gets really, you know, I can be specific about the problems, but replace. You see in that replace. Immediate. Um, water ungrounded brass shell that you have to grab to turn the switch immediate people die from this stuff old floor receptacle knob and tube might have had junction boxes oh please kill me please kill me ungrounded light fixtures metal light fixtures above metal faucets Steel pipe, you touch the light fixture, there's a fault in the light fixture, you touch the faucet handle, you become the grounding conductor. That's please kill me stuff. And put your 
Testra, many of them sing right out at you. Please kill me stuff. Please kill, please kill your client and you inspected the house. I mean, it's bad your client's dead. You wish you were once the attorney gets a hold of stuff like that. Um, ground faults will work without a grounding conductor. Old wiring in bathrooms and kitchens is bad. Upgrade is recommended. Scream an issue in your reports. You know, don't shy from this stuff. You, you know, again, realtors might not like you, but you are working for your clients. You are protecting their safety and their property. And that's please kill me. Uh, please, please kill. And these are meant, you know, for electric razors, radios, not hair dryers and curling irons, which have actually ground faults built into them, but you're just going to fry this stuff. Please kill me. Please kill me. You know, just all kinds, all kinds of issues. 42 circuits maximum, 60 circuits, 2015. If you've got a bunch of breakers wedged in there, a panel is full-size panel filled with breakers and you've got twins in there, count them, but odds are reasonable. There's too many, too many circuits in there. Volume space for panel boxes, 2003, poss possibly overhead service drops. You don't want to be able to grab an unfused conductor. Three foot clearance. Here they did an addition. Now it's over the roof and running down in there. Luckily, it's plastic gutters. Um, overhead service did an apartment outside stair. The insulation just fraying off of that drop. How did I run out of time again with eight hours? Clearance to panels. Access, remodeled the kitchen. Lock on the panel. The kid can turn your power off. Let the kid turn the power off. Walk outside, turn it back on. But if you're looking for the key to find that lock to get in there to shut the house off an emergency, good luck. Just, you can't make this stuff up. Um, subject to damage, there's your water meter. Bathroom and a utility room, power panel under the box, clever, no good. Kneel on the washer and dryer to pull the cover off, stove. Um, also, there was no main breaker in that panel. You had to turn every breaker in that off, turn that service out, turn that house off. There was no disconnect outside. Now, somebody probably approved that. I've, you know, I've run into, ah, had that one twice. Panel boxes in bathrooms were acceptable, not in the tub area, in the tub. I'd seen one with a shower curtain over it, in the tub, till like the 80s, but no, no longer. Um, panel box over a stair, you can't stand there and not fall. If you see that, it says use antioxidant on the aluminum. Deteriorated service entrance cable. Water coming into the panel box, follows the service entrance cable, drains down in there. When it's coming into the top and running down through the breakers, that's just tear the whole thing out and replace it. And, you know, you'll see that rust stains on the breakers asbestos lining so if it catches fire it's not going to burn the house down e live in use at the time distribution basically you need a lot of circuits heating you need a separate circuit for your furnace kitchen and dining area under cabinet lighting i just see a ton of this stuff that's 120 volt to that light zip cord is not uh, approved for concealed use. It's just always wrong. If it's Romex running out there, it's okay. Or if it's 12 volts. Branch circuits, bathrooms, old houses, minimum 120 amp circuit for bathroom receptacles. 
there's no limit to the maximum number of receptacles on a circuit. Fixed loads shall not exceed 80% of the branch circuit. That's why your water heaters that run on like 16, 17 amps can't be put on a 20 amp circuit because 80% of the 16 amps exceeds 20 amps. So you're, that's why your water heaters are on 30 amp circuits. Um, doesn't limit the number of receptacles, but it does say the load shall be distributed between the circuits. So if you trip a ground fault and you notice that the entire finished basement is now off and it was wired on the ground fault that was in the basement that's doing the exterior receptacles and maybe the garage to boot, no good. Sometimes you find the things by luck. Knob and tube problems, aluminum branch circuit wiring. I stuck this in last night. If you're looking in the panel box and you see this is 120 volt circuit wiring, just scream, bloody murder. There are neighborhoods that have this, but just look carefully. Don't, don't miss that. Putting antioxidant on the stuff in the panel box doesn't help the rest of the house. Also, four copper wire only on the house that was run with aluminum branch circuit wiring. Splices in boxes, except underground splices. Uh, get here, knob and tube. Yes. Yes, aluminum wiring generally would have a would always have a plastic jacket, but there is tin copper. If you can see the cut ends of it, you basically have solder on the outside of the copper wire. That's that's fine. Yes, it, it will be. It's it's old. This is what I call WFM. What a friggin' mess. Wooden conduit. Great idea. Oh, this is all abandoned. This is all abandoned. We got rid of all that stuff. Yeah. Wooden conduit going to loom running the top of door frame. That's Jim's photo from years ago. WFM2. Rag wire, your knob and tube, wrap, soldered, rubber tape, friction tape on top. Any of these new connections, you have no idea, but just this is not repair, this is this is replace. This is big bucks. Arc faults aren't gonna have, you know, arc, far, arc mm -hmm. faults are not going to address these sort of issues. Grounding to a water pipe used to be allowed no longer. Metal conduit, high resistance ground of over six feet long, bushings required. Metal flexible conduit, armor cable has a grounding conductor. The grounding conductor can be like a small aluminum wire. You see some of this old metal clad, metal jacketed cable. And when you're looking at the panel box, you see these little bitty aluminum wires just hanging around. They can be cut off. They don't need to be terminated, but that actually is connected to the whole steel jacket. So theater, theoretically that bonds it. So some of the armored cable is poor. Some of it is okay. you know, mess in cellulose insulation, mess, and you can see there's no, you know, no grounding. So high resistance grounds. Um, you could probably, you know, upgrade recommended if you don't want to say replace. Asbestos lagging under that burlap? I don't know, but I'm not, this is an electrical photo, so I, I don't know. What the, I can't remember at this point, but may may have been. Um, you know, feed to a barn, single conductor cable brought in, spliced above the panel, and then they still ran the single conductor cable down into the panel. Electrical code says neat and workmanlike manner by the book. Bob says if he needed to fail somebody and he didn't know why, he could always go to a neat and workmanlike manner. And, you know, all these switches would run everything in the house. It's a low voltage switching with relays. Sometimes these these relay switching panels are in an attic. You'll push the switches. You'll hear click, 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 click. And they're, the relays are somewhere in the house. 
you could plug a light, you could screw a light in there, you could screw a receptacle in there. Don't assume that this stuff is abandoned. Floor receptacles, barber shop, the one that burned down, I think. Armor cable running into a fireplace. You know the insulation on those wires was cooked. This is, again, please kill me. Metal appliance that was intended to be grounded is not grounded. Needs more receptacles. Oh, surge protector plugged into a two-slot receptacle. They do not work unless they are grounded. The surge protector that is not grounded does not work. Again, here you can hang drywall and run a nail through the electrical conductors. Just fussy. Replace it with an LED bulb, easy. You see a lightning system, look to see that it's actually connected to the ground. You're not required to inspect those, but if somebody's putting something on the top of the building to attract lightning, you wanna make sure that it is properly discharged. And here's another instance, same issue. So just check them. You don't have to, but it's easy enough. You're wandering around outside anyhow. Distribution, you want to see a lot of receptacles, the garage, one receptacle in each, all this stuff. And then this is your inspecting the house and this is what you see. Um, you know, old electrical, kitchens and bathrooms, bad. Not upgrade, replace. Bring to current standards. End of statement. No argument. Set the house on fire. You know, microwave, coffee maker, toaster. Now, they would typically complain that when they use two of the three appliances that the breaker trips. Yeah, right. Should. Your house hasn't burned down. And yeah, you'd be all right for two out of three. Three out of three is still tough. Um, arc fall to ground fall. I consider these must do upgrades at this point. Must do. Again, nobody you should, but this is must do stuff. They're cheap. They're protecting life and property. Arc faults can protect the older wiring, smoke detector inspections in Virginia. I'm not quite clear about that since all this came out, but I darn well put 10 year interconnected in my rental properties. And since I was buying them, I finally put them in my house. 10 years replacement recommended. If you think it's 10 years, now you have carbon monoxide detectors. Man, how did I get so far behind? Kerosene. Un until you get tired of me. Valid. Valid until I see more people leaving than staying. Um, oil has a pump. Kerosene works on gravity. So if the tank's up in the air, it's most likely a kerosene tank. That's a buried oil tank. Wait a minute, I can see it. What's the bottom? It's sitting in the ground. Inside tank for oil burner fuel. That tank, inside tank, very common. Don't see it's problematic. You're supposed to inspect a fireplace. Sometimes it's tough. Should be two thirds tall as they are wide. That's probably smoky and you have a pretty good idea. Again, you don't need to do this, but now that guy was probably built for coal and smokes like the Dickens. If you've never cut an oil tank open, you not believe what's in the bottom of the piece of the <laughs> Um. That should all be parged by current standards. And there's a gap at the flue tile. This is looking from a fireplace up at an old unlined chimney. These should not be used until serious money has been spent. The metal heat elators, got a crack. Got another failure. You got to look at them carefully. That's the metal heat elators. They're 50, 60, 70 years old now. New lining cast in place, that's in England, a huge fireplace. Wood stoves, clearance to combustibles, unless it tells you otherwise it's 36 inches. You know, does that actually drain? Why would someone do that? Not 36 away. This was actually a coal burner, little potbelly coal stove 
and they would put multiple ones in there. That's the ones with the pie plates on the wall. Oh, people, I want to open that up and put the fireplace back. There was never one there. Yes, there was. No, it's a mantle. And you see that base molding running? No, no. Steam heat. Steam heat, the pipes get 160, 180, 200 degrees. The radiators get that hot. People have little kids, burns. Auto fill valve to identify steam and also the Hartford loop. So if the boiler, the piping fails, the water doesn't run out of the boiler and crack the boiler. Hot water heat, you got a boiler, you got a backflow preventer, which is most times not there. That is not the fill valve, that's a backflow preventer and an expansion tank, converted coal, flooded, should be abandoned in working in use. E. You can't get parts. Yeah, and there's a bunch of money in that stuff now. If you guys are getting the text messages, you sign out with it down. Fall down. He owes how you now. Repaired firebox. Your efficiency in this stuff is is horrible. Two zones an auto fill valve, but it is not a backflow preventer. A backflow preventer is a check valve, prevents the boiler water from going in. Copper, cast iron radiators, added heat, exposed piping, leaks, repair, mini split condensate drain directly into a sewer. Yeah, hot air, heat, old furnaces, four inch ducts, they don't work for air conditioning. Supply and return, return in a closet, pan ducts, a terrible, and maybe some asbestos cement board for good luck. Pan joist, just lousy damage. The high velocity forced air systems, great way to retrofit. Higher efficiency furnaces, gas appliances, and masonry chimneys are generally should have linings. You know, this is just bad. Abandoned systems, old and poke around them, you may find asbestos, chimneys abandoned, insulation, fiberglass, what's left of it, cellulose, mineral or cotton fiber, foam insulation, suspected asbestos containing material, insulation upside down in the crawl space, almost always. Okay, so, so we, did, we got to do the, uh, people try to sign off, we got to do the, uh, the giveaways, so. Can I have 60 more seconds? 60 more seconds, yeah. Uh, because I think we'll do it. Um, insulation problems, inadequate, combustible, vapor barriers, missing, improper installation, changes can cause problems, wrong side exposed so often, but it's a fire hazard, so that's a problem item. That stuff is paper with asphalt on the back of it burns really well. Uh, you know, wrong, asbestos, suspected asbestos containing material, ventilation, attics, crawl spaces, kitchens, bathrooms, all kinds of problems with your ventilation changes. In construction, you go from a, a wood roof or a slate roof to a shingle roof with sheathing, your attic that had plenty of ventilation through the slate has no ventilation, can dramatically affect the moisture in the attic. Uh, your fans are disrecommended, soffit vents are easy. Kitchen, look for the exhaust. It's gotta be in solid metal duct, not flex, not plastic. I've seen kitchen fans going into plastic. Suspected asbestos containing material, Illegal removal where they took the big stuff off and broke it off that in the crawl space that I just came out of or went into on the ducts all over the place. Just a little bit of water service, but asbestos on the floor and you're looking down and you're standing on the stuff. Vinyl asbestos, mold, sewage. Oil tank. 